It's, it's 7 o'clock, so I'll call the uh, committee of the whole meeting to order, and I will ask for a roll call. Uh, uh, President Berg. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Boren. Here. Berg. Here. Serta. Here. Davis. Here. Groth. Here. Hannah. Here. Kittleston. Here. Clayunas. Here. Manny. Excused. Meyer. Here. Montemayor. Here. Radke. Here. Ryan. Here. Shusha. Here. Vanderweel. Here. Fifteen present, one excused. Thank you, President Berg. Then I'll ask for approval of minutes of the last meeting held September 11th, 2006. There was a mistake on your agenda. It was September 11th of our last meeting. And we'll note that Alderman Verhassel is here. <laughs> Thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second of approval of the minutes? Motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. We're going to begin with discussion regarding the various aspects of tasers and their use. And I will start off with our, uh, our chief, Chief Kirk. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, tonight, I wish to thank the uh, Committee of the Whole uh, for allowing us to be here uh, to present uh, to you information. And mainly, or more effective, I believe, is to answer questions that you may have. Uh, I wish to uh, say thank you to uh, this Common Council for last year providing the funding uh, for these tasers. I wish to thank the mayor for his initial support of this and the continued support of tasers. Uh, I know they, uh, there have been some questions that have raised or some issues that seem to constantly uh, surround this issue. So uh, what I did was, uh, in speaking with the administrative staff, we came up with who, who do we know who can best answer these. Uh, we talked to uh, President uh, Silas uh, Vanderweel to what would be the best format to determine what's the best format to answer these questions, to pose or provide this information to you. And I believe what we did here tonight was we, we created probably the, the best panel that I've ever seen to address the, the taser issue. And it's, it's not necessarily this side, it's really the members on this panel on this side who have very, very graciously given of themselves to come to Sheboygan to explain taser, its use, its weaknesses, its strengths, and whatever questions you have. So here tonight, I would, I would say tonight we have Lieutenant Tim Eirich, who is the lieutenant in charge of our training in the sense of tasers. He voluntarily gave of himself, took on the training, uh, and then has trained our department. Uh, that training took place on shifts. No overtime was paid for this. Uh, he, he worked day shift afternoons and midnights, and he gave himself and, and his off time to, uh, to come and tra train the officers. And, of course, Deputy Chief Shervin. The next person we have is Lieutenant David Nichols. He's from the Appleton Police Department. He is the one who has trained Lieutenant Tim Eirich. He is probably one of the, the regional, he's, he's deemed one of the experts in the region. He is highly sought after to explain and to train others. And I thank you, uh, David, for being here today. And then we also have officer and attorney uh, Michael Brave. Michael's from the western portion of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I will allow them, both of them, as we go on later, to give just a brief biography of them and what, what their uh, expertise is. To start, uh, we've addressed tasers in its use uh, several times now for the city. Uh, I think uh, we certainly understand that the police department, police officers have a unique role in society uh, that we must respond to resistance or its threat of, uh, its threat of resistance when we place uh, individuals or people under arrest. So with that, um, it's probably, tasers is probably one of the most effective tools I've ever seen in policing. I've been in policing now just under 30 years. It, I have seen nothing like it. I, I attended probably three or four of uh, Lieutenant Nichols' uh, presentation at various locations before I became um, just attached to the issue that we should have tasers. It not only reduces the officer's injuries, but it reduces the injuries of the public. And it's very, very important uh, that if you have any questions here tonight, please don't walk away 
uh, from this presentation or answer and, uh, qu and question session without your, your answers uh, to your questions. So please take advantage of this. Uh, tonight we wish to partner not only with the Common Council, but we want to partner with the community in the sense that let's provide the answers the best we can to come to the, the resolution on this matter so that when we provide you the information, there's, I've been at different meetings and people have questions and the last public protection and safety meeting there, were, there was questions posed of me and, and some of my staff and I didn't have the answers, but tonight we do in these two experts. So uh, with them, I, I would just finish by saying we, I believe there's approximately 4,000 police departments that use tasers um, and it's demonstrated to be one of the safest uh, methods to control people uh, without causing injury. So with that, um, I'll give it back to uh, the president. Thank you, Chief. Um, do we want to start with questions or would you? Um, if I may, I just give you a, a brief history of uh, my involvement with uh, electronic control devices. Uh, in Wisconsin, we're trying to uh, move away from calling them uh, by the uh, corporate name. Taser is the name of a company. The device that they make is an electronic control device. I'll trip over my tongue a few times trying to call it an electronic control device because it's been a product of its, of its success. I've been uh, associated with electronic control devices for the City of Appleton Police Department um, since late uh, 2000. In January of 2001, the City of Appleton Police Department moved forward with a electronic control device program and we've been deploying them with our patrol officers since January of 2001. Now we have uh, learned a lot from our program. We have seen a lot of success, tremendous success. We've also seen failures. Um, we've learned from our failures. We've um, looked at our training and looked at our policies um, and, and uh, it's kind of a, a, uh, a work in progress. What uh, my involvement has been uh, early on was to re research the device, research the technology, and then uh, make some determinations on was this going to be uh, an acceptable use of force tool for the City of Appleton Police Department. And I will refer to it that way uh, throughout the evening. It is just another tool, it's another option. It does not replace um, other tools and other techniques, it supplements it. Used in the right set of circumstances, it is a tremendous tool for law enforcement. But there are issues like with any tool um, where there's got to be uh, accountability to the way that the device is used. There's got to be, um, uh, in my belief and what we looked at in the City of Appleton Police Department was this. There are five things that will make a successful program, whether we're dealing with tasers, electronic control devices, or whether we're dealing with other use of force tools. I think first you have to have good policy. You have to have very firm good policy within your agency on how you're going to use a device. The second thing that you need is good training. Um, and sometimes in law enforcement when we, uh, when we have tools and devices, we spend more time training our people on how to use the tool instead of how to apply the policy and then correctly use the tool. So a big part of it is, uh, is good training along with your policy. The third key, and I think very important, regardless of the use of force tool that you're going to use, is you must re review every incident in which you use the device, um, whether it be OC pepper spray, whether it be batons, beanbag rounds, whether you uh, use an elbow strike or a knee strike. When you're using force against a person, you should review each one of those use of force um, incidents to find out do they comply with your policy and do they comply with your training? And if not, number four, accountability, accountability, accountability. If you have, if you review one of these incidents um, and you determine that it's outside of your policy and it's outside of your training, you must hold people accountable for that. Um, and that may mean retraining, uh, modifying your policy. It may mean discipline. But if you're not looking at each incident, um, how do you know whether you're complying with your policy and your training? Uh, the uh, you know, the last piece, and I think a very important piece, 
is you must educate and engage the community, engage forums like this to educate people on what this device is. There's a lot of people out there that think they know what this thing is um, and really don't have a lot of um, idea of what it is. Um, so you must educate your community leaders, you must educate um, your administrators and the media because if you don't, um, uh, there's going to be misinformation. So my involvement has been to uh, start our program, uh, grow our program, and modify it as needed. And we've had tremendous success, and we've had some failures. Um, and I appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to be here. Great evening, and I, too, am very happy to be here. First, a disclaimer. In addition to being a Wisconsin attorney, Wisconsin police officer, trainer, et cetera, I am also National Litigation Counsel for TASER. So, like I said, what Dave and I are here for tonight, and by the way, I personally believe Dave is the best master taser instructor that exists today. So Thank you. he's trying to turn bright red on me here, but I truly believe that. But anyway, what we really want to do is we could talk about this subject for a month, and I know you don't want to do that. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit to get you away from the electrophobia, the irrational fear of electricity, just in about two minutes, and then just answer any questions that you've got, no matter what they may be. If you've got a question in any way, shape, or form, revolves around taser, uh, use of force, use of force in Wisconsin, federal constitutional parameters on use of force, whatever it may be, we'd like to address those. So first, if you don't mind, I'll stand up to do this. A couple of things about electrophobia. A lot of people are scared of tasers because they've heard 50,000 volts. You've heard that, right? Do you realize that over a one-second baseline, the number of volts that actually goes into a person from an X-26 taser is only 0.76 volts. However, the media would not get a good headline if they said 0.76 volts used to take a person to the ground. So just a couple of things to put this into perspective. First of all, this is what powers an X-26 taser. These are photo batteries. Uh, it, it does, there are two of them. They're three volts apiece, and you can buy these at Best Buy. However, these are the ones. I'll pass them around just so you can look at them, but that's what powers them. Now. When you start looking at this and putting it into perspective, I want to give you some numbers here, if, I, if my cord will reach. First, a taser puts out, generates, nineteen pulses per second. They're very short pulses, which I'll describe, describe in a minute. But it's nineteen pulses per second. That's how many it puts out. Then. If you hold the trigger back, it will dis it rephrase. If you pull the trigger and let it go, it will discharge for five seconds. So here's your math question for the night, the first one. If you multiply those two things out, 19 pulses per second times five seconds, how many pulses are there in five seconds? 195? Very good. Is that, is that right? No, it's not right. No, 195. Okay. I'm an attorney, not an accountant. Sorry. Now, so there's 95, 95 pulses in five seconds. Now. One set of batteries in a taser, one set will discharge this number, this amount of times, 195 times. Thus, what's the number there, Dave? 18525? Yes. Thus, there are 18,525 pulses of electricity coming out of those two little three volt batteries. That's it. Therefore, the question to you is, how, many, how much current could be in any one pulse? Okay. Now, as far as duration, you'll see the stack of paper here. We use this for a reason. There's 10,000 sheets of paper here. A taser pulse is 100 microseconds. Thus, one of these 19 pulses lasts, if this, if this, if this 10,000 sheets represents one second of time, as an example, out of that electric socket, wherever they are, is the power on continuously for that full one second? Yes, it is. Out of a taser, if this represents one second of time, one piece of paper equals one pulse in time. That's it. So that, uh, one pulse equals one piece of paper out of 10,000 for one second. So therefore, for a full one second, how many pieces of paper would represent how much a taser is discharging? 19 pulses per second. If one piece of paper equals one pulse, then how many pieces of paper would be for one full second? 19. You got it. It's that simple. So the short version is, if I were to take 18 more pieces of paper off of this, if that represented one second, all the rest of that time that taser is not discharging any electricity at all. Now, one more thing. 
This is going to get interesting before the night's over. Every, everybody's heard this 50,000 volts. Put this into perspective. Here's why the taser does have 50,000 volts peak arcing voltage. It's real simple. Because we want the taser to be able to jump through up to two inches of clothing. That's why. If, that, if the taser would go directly into the body every single time and actually penetrate into the body, you would not need this. This is arcing voltage. This is not what enters the body. 50,000 volts. Something else to remember, go back to your high school electricity classes. If I were to shuffle my feet across this floor and touch something metal, how many volts of electricity is in a static electricity charge? 30,000 to 50,000? A static electricity charge will have 30 to 50,000 volts. Secondly, does anybody know what a Van de Graaff generator is? Do you remember going to a museum when you were a kid? You put your hand on a Van de Graaff generator and your hair stands up? How many volts is that? Up to 25 million. So when you hear this 50,000 volt thing, that really doesn't mean much. All that 50,000 volts is, is it takes approximately 1,000 volts of pressure to jump one millimeter, and therefore 50,000 volts equals about two inches. That's all it is. The amount of, electricity, the amount of voltage that actually enters the body is only 1,200. That's what actually enters the body. But remember, static electricity is 30,000 volts. And then when you average over to one second baseline, remember, it's a very short amount of time the taser is actually on. That means the amount of voltage going into the body over one second is only 0 0.76 volts. So what's important to think about here is it's incre these, these are not, believe it or not, these are not nuclear power cells. If they were, then it, it, as a lot of media thinks we can generate, which we can't, we could power your house with these things. That's not what it is. These are camera batteries. That's all they put out. There are over 18,000 pulses out of these two little batteries. They're very low current. They're very low voltage that actually enters and goes through the body, and it has very little effect on the body. Okay? So that kind of hopefully puts a little perspective for you as to how it works. Now, how does it work on the body? The old taser device, the old stun devices from 10 years ago, what they would do is anybody here in their hands have heat sensors, they've got touch, they've got feel, they have pressure, all those little nerves are inside your hands. How do those newer nerves work with your brain? The nerves work by changing their electrical polarity, sending a signal to your brain which says either temperature, pressure, cold, whatever it is, whatever that nerve is sensing. So what is like, when electricity hits that, what does electricity do? It causes them what? It causes them all to fire at the exact same time. That's why the sensation of the taser is perceived as pain. Now, coming the other way, how do your muscles work? If you tell your brain, I want my arm to move now, how does that work? It sends a signal from your brain down to the motor neuron, and that motor neuron, through electricity, through chemicals, then tells your muscle to contract. The old stun devices from 10, 15 years ago, all they did was cause the pain sensation to go from the nerves to the brain. That's why they would not stop everyone who, was, who encountered it. However, the taser is finely tuned. It's finely tuned to disrupt your mental processes from going down through your motor neuron to your muscles. That's how it works. Example, if this gentleman and I were having a phone conversation, and he came on and was screaming as loud as he could over the telephone, how well would we be able to communicate? We wouldn't. But as soon as he is done yelling, will we be able to communicate again? And the answer is yes. That's what the taser does. It causes the nerve cells to basically fire and basically come up as discomfort. It also disrupts your ability to volitionally control your muscles by causing disturbance on the motor neurons. That's how it works. So it's really a very simple process, takes very little electricity to make that happen, and it's very finely tuned to cause that to occur. Simple example. Why is a taser at 19 pulses per second? I'll give you one example. Originally, when the X26 came out in 2003, that's the one your officers are carrying, that's what Dave has on, they were set at, with a five second cycle, you pull the trigger, it goes for five seconds. The first two seconds were at 19 pulses per second, the next three to seconds dropped to 15. Why? Number one, so the person would not have so many contractions. And number two, to save on the batteries, because even they can get expensive. However, in Colorado Springs a couple of years ago, when they still had 19 pulses for the first two seconds, then dropped to 15 for the next three, they had a suicidal male with a gun. They hit him with the taser. He's got the gun in his hand. For the first two seconds, it locked him up. When it dropped from 19 cycles per second, 19 pulses, to 15, he was able to muscle that gun up to his chest, shoot and kill himself. That's why the tasers today, all the X-26s, are set at 19 pulses per second to prevent 
that kind of thing from happening. So the 19 pulses are designed to lock the person up, but no more than necessary, and to prevent them from harming themselves or others. So again, what I'm trying to point out here is number one, don't have electrical phobia, an unreasonable fear of electricity. This device puts out very little actual current or electricity. Number two, understand those pulses per second are very short, 100 microseconds each. That's it, and there's only 19 of them. The vast majority of the time, the taser is not even on. And number three, everything that taser put into this weapon, into this device, there's a reason for. And if you have any questions, Dave or I or whoever else is up here, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, before we get to questions, I want to have uh, Deputy Chief Shervin uh, speak a little bit about it. One of the things that uh, Lieutenant Nichols had mentioned was if these things were addressed in policy and training. And our Sheboygan Police Department policy does address the tasers. There's uh, nine points that it gives. There also is a review process for any time that the, uh, that the taser is, is deployed. One other thing to bear in mind is the Sheboygan Police Department is an accredited agency that fits state certifications, and this would apply to the, uh, to the, taser, uh, to the taser also. All of our officers in the Sheboygan Police Department uh, have gone through a state-approved recruit school. All of our officers are certified. The policy that we, that we use, the use of force policy or the force continuum policy, is identical to that of the state. The Tasers uh, come under the same use of force as the OC, and our officers do follow the, uh, the use of force policy. Uh, the uh, OC has been uh, utilized for a number of years. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. At times, the officers, uh, that when they use the OC, if the person is a very motivated individual, it won't have effect. I can tell from my own personal experiences that the taser does work. You cannot do anything. Uh, Lieutenant Eirik and myself have been uh, tased, and you are not able to fight or, or resist. So I support the taser for the uh, uh, safety of our officers. All right, uh, Alderman Montemur. Um, thank you, Chairman Vanderwill. Um, Mr. Brave, I have this right. You're the National Litigation Counsel for the Taser Company? Yes, I am. I'm also a master taser instructor and legal advisor to the taser training board, and I've been teaching electronic control devices since the early 90s. Um, now, we got the impression that it can't do any electrical harm, but it certainly gives extreme pain. I think nobody can argue with that, that it does inflict extreme pain. And I think I got the information that in order for it to immobilize it has to have the pain, not that the pain immobilizes it, but it has to, in order for it to work, it, it, it's dual, it's pain and immobilization. Not so, purposefully pain, but the pain must be there in order to immobilize. Since the pain, the, the short answer is yes. yes. Since, since the pain is, a, is at a lower threshold than activating the motor neurons, that is why you have to go there first. It's interesting though, as the chief and I were discussing before we came here tonight, uh, both Dave and I know a couple of gentlemen, one, Hans Marrero and another one, uh, Peter Boatman from the United Kingdom, they've both been hit between 300 and 500 times, and they will tell you that once you get beyond, uh, whenever you're caused to not be able to control your body, there's a little bit of panic involved, and once you get beyond that, they describe it as a sensation other than pain. But the vast majority of people that are hit only once, et cetera, it is considered extreme pain, and number two, they don't want it again. I remember we did see one little video uh, last year or before, and it was a little blurb in there. It was a chief from someplace in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I do remember clearly him bragging that the, the criminals on the street are behaving because they yell to each other, behave, they've got the chair. Meaning, you know, that's what, what the criminals meant. Now, it works or it doesn't work, but it, Evidently, it does work for you. It does seem barbaric to, ex to um, expose people to, to such extreme pain. And most, most of them don't give you trouble because it hurts so much. Now, how about a special needs person, especially the one here, it had to be tased repeatedly, so the pain certainly didn't stop him. And it took many times before he was immobilized 
Am I correct? Do it. Do it official. Me too. I mean, did you uh, want Mr. Bray? Uh, whoever can answer. Uh, I, I would like to comment as well. Uh, I'll let Dave, just a second. Sorry, Dave. Uh, a couple of things. First, th some of the best statistics we are getting now is once an agency has had taser devices on the road for a while, we're finding that out of five times it's pulled and the laser's put on someone, the laser light, four times out of that five, they don't have to pull the trigger because people are now complying. Secondly, uh, with the incidents you're talking about, just so you know, I'm also a police officer. I'm also certified to teach. I'm going to do this real quick just because there's no point to it other than just let you know. I am certified to teach handgun, shotgun, rifle, submachine gun, chemical irritant, chemical inflammatory, chemical aerosol, chemical munitions, pepper spray from fiber in schools, spontaneous knife defense, lateral vascular neck restraint, unilateral neck restraint, weapon disarm, retention, defensive tactics, distraction devices, electronic control devices. So in other words, I'm certified to teach almost any use of force that's out there. Now, I also have reviewed the report of the one that you're referring to. The gentleman was 210 pounds. He was causing a disturbance. He could not be controlled. Let's for a minute go through the tools that law enforcement officers have at their disposal to try to control him. One of them, of course, is their firearm, which, of course, we, ne we never want to do except as a last resort. That's just, we just don't. The other devices, other than the electronic control device, either A, cause intense pain, or B, break things, such as a baton. Either A, I hit you to hurt you, cause you pain, or I hit you intentionally to break a, a, a knee, a thigh, et cetera, and still, if the person is not feeling pain, that still may not control them. Pepper spray. Like I said, I've read the report, and the officers state that when the gentleman, as I understand his name was Brian, was going one direction, there were num numerous other residents of the home right there. When he went back the other way, there were numerous re residents there. If they had used pepper spray, which is only resin capsicum, in that environment, they would have contaminated everyone. And the second thing is, you want to talk about pain, I've been hit with pepper spray five times because I'm instructor from five schools. It teaches you two things. I wanted to know, was there a difference between the various sprays? Number one, there isn't. Number two, it proves I'm stupid. And number three, I will never get hit with pepper spray again because you want to feel pain, hit, get hit with pepper spray. But so, so therefore, pepper spray, two things. First, it would not have worked in that environment because it was enclosed and because someone else would have been contaminated, probably a lot of people. Secondly, it does not, the taser, the discomfort, the pain stops the minute the power's off. Pepper spray will go on for 30 to 45 minutes or longer. Also, on someone who is having mental health issues, that person, in at least 20% of the time, the pepper spray will have no effect on them whatsoever. I've also done over 140 expert witness cases across the country and involving use of force in law enforcement, and I have numerous cases, especially one, uh, one, including one up in Michigan, where they used pepper spray on them, it had no effect at all, and therefore would not have been a viable tool. So the next issue is, okay, then we have physical. Well, this gentleman was out of control. He was hitting people. He weighed 210 pounds. That is exactly the type of event that the electronic control device was designed to be used. Because it is, the, the key is to, electronic control device is not to control them. It's not to restrain them. It's to get them captured long enough to get them in the handcuffs, et cetera. And secondly, there's a document I brought with me. There was a study completed about three months ago on use of a electronic control device taser on mental health people. And the document shows that in the short amount of time since the taser's been out, which is since 1999, there have been documented over 1,100 people who the taser was used on in mental health cases where had they not used the taser, they would have resorted to deadly force and basically shot the person or wounded them. So it has saved at least that many lives. So in the Brian case, while it is unfortunate that he had ex experienced the pain, that was actually the least harmful, especially long-term device or tactic they could have used for everyone concerned, and it's the only one that was even practical in its circumstances. Dave? So is there a special training for special needs people? Um, yes. I'll, I'll comment on that. That is a screen that I have up. I was um, involved um, in assisting TASER in writing the newest version of their training program. Um, and there are some issues that we've addressed in there, some things that, um, that we've been training at our agency for a while. And the slide that I actually have up in front of me, and I, and I want to comment a little bit also on what you had asked Mr. Brave earlier. There's a slide here within our training of the city of Appleton where I call, uh, I call it elevated justification based on societal perceptions. So it's a lot of words, which really means this. We have to um, understand and accept in law enforcement that society provides people in certain groups greater protection from police tactics. And whether we like that or not, that, that is a fact. Um, a couple of the examples that I give our officers in, um, 
um, in people within these groups or similar groups are children, the elderly, mentally challenged, and people who are restrained. It's not to say that you cannot use a device on someone who fits into one of those categories, but the threat to the officer and the threat to the others should be correspondingly high, in most cases should be elevated. There is probably no one, in, and certainly in the state of Wisconsin, that believes more in this device if used properly is a tremendous law enforcement tool. But if someone from the Appleton Police Department or the Sheboygan Police Department uses an ECD on my 14-year-old child, you better have a good explanation for me, okay? And that's the mindset that the officers need to have. And that comes through proper policy and proper training. Now, um, I was involved in using this device on a 13-year-old Hmong child, okay? Now, in this particular situation, she had a sword. Okay, and had we not used the device on her, we may have had to use deadly force. It doesn't replace deadly force, but if we can do it safely um, with lethal cover, we, we will try that. I was also involved in it being used on a 21-year-old girl with Down syndrome. And in that particular case, she had a knife, had assaulted her caseworker, who was there to visit her, and charged at our officers with that knife. Now, can you use it on a mentally um, challenged person? Absolutely, but that threat that the officer should be facing must be correspondingly high. If you use it on my 14-year-old child, it better not be because they didn't cooperate with you to go to the office, okay? It better be that there, there was more to it. The second piece is when you asked before about pain. Uh, Mr. Brave is, is, he is a, a fantastic uh, uh, person at explaining the technical aspects of all of this. Um, I've been hit. I, I'm going to tell you more from a, uh, just my common perspective of what it feels like. I've been hit six times with the device. Uh, the, I can tell you that for me, it is not painful. It is the most overwhelming sensation, and I just want it to stop. But it's not like I hit my thumb with a hammer. It's not pain like that. And as soon as it is off, it's gone, and you can, and you can recover. I've been sprayed by pepper spray. All other tools and techniques in law enforcement work in one way, shape, or form off of pain. That, that, that's how they're designed. The ECD takes it a step further, and as he was describing before, for me, this is the way it works. Okay? Have any of you ever had, um, the reason that people yell out and scream, have you ever had, in the middle of the night or while you're driving a car, this is what it feels like if you've never been hit with an ECD. Have you ever had a sudden involuntary Charlie horse in the back of your leg where your leg just locks up and you holler out, oh, that's what happens to your body. You get a sudden muscle cramp and you involuntarily yell out. For me, it's not pain. I've exposed at least several hundred, probably a thousand people to the device. About 50 to 75% of the people will say, you're lying, that hurt, okay? But the way it works is this. Your nervous system, the whole system is designed to keep you alive and keep you safe. And it has three components. You have sensory nerves, as Mr. Brave talked about. You have motor nerves, and you have your central nervous system. Your sensory nerves are those nerves that sit close to the surface of your skin and gather information about the environment, such as painful stimulus, heat, cold, um, uh, relative body positioning. And those nerves send signals to your central nervous system, your brain. And your brain takes in those signals and makes a decision about it. For instance, if I were to grab Mr. Brave and pinch him in the back of the arm, sensory nerves are going to send signals to his brain to tell, to tell him that hurts. It's a painful stimulus. His brain, central nervous system, makes a decision about it and says, I, I don't like that. Make it stop. It sends signals out to the third component, his motor nerves, that control his muscle movement to tell him how to make it stop, to move his arm. The ECD works not only on pain, and not to someone who has a mind-body disconnect, someone who's very agitated, very intoxicated, an emotionally disturbed person, many of them are impervious to pain. They don't stop because it hurts. We train our police officers to get sprayed with pepper spray. I've been sprayed multiple times with pepper spray. You'll never do that to me again on purpose because to me it lasts 45 minutes to an hour. But we teach our police officers after they get sprayed to fight because you can fight through pain and soak in the bad guys. We've all been 
you know, in a fight with our brother or sister or a neighbor and suffered an injury during the fight. The pain doesn't, well, most people have, the, 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 the pain doesn't stop you during the fight. It affects you after the fight. And that's the big difference with this device because it causes the muscle contraction to not um, cause you to want to stop fighting because it hurts. You stop because you get the muscle cramp, okay? So I don't know the case of the mentally challenged individual. Probably the multiple cycles where there were not officers available immediately to get him restrained, and he wasn't going to stop with pain because of being an emotionally disturbed person. But yes, it can be used on someone in those groups, but your policy and your debrief of that incident should show that that threat level was correspondingly high, much like someone in restraints, handcuffs. Can you use it on somebody that's in handcuffs? My answer to that is, it depends. Tell me about it. You can only use force, in my opinion, to establish and maintain control, not to punish people. Establish and maintain control. And that should be the purpose of your use of force. If you have a person that's in handcuffs and they, you know, for instance, spit at you or call you a bunch of names, you can't justify using an ECD on that person for that reason. If you're trying to get them out of the squad car and they kick you and you try and come from the other side of the squad car and they try and headbutt you and they're biting, could you use it then to establish control? I think you could, but you can't use it to punish, and that is a, that is a critical issue. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, Chief Crook wants to make a comment. If, if we get back to the RCS situation, uh, we must remember that uh, a special needs adult was an adult, and it was uh, six foot, 210 pounds. You have to also remember that there were 10 people who were trained to work with and to care for those special needs adults. When something went wrong, when that special needs adult was out of control, they called the police department. When that officer arrived, it was one officer who arrived. Now, you already had 10 people who were trained as supervisors or help workers or what have you. They're all specially trained to deal with that special uh, group of, of people and bless their soul because I don't believe I could do that job. I, I, I really don't believe I could. However, when they could not control the situation, they called upon the police department. One officer arrived at that time. There was another officer en route, but one officer arrived. That officer was being charged by this person. We have to remember, and we put the policy, I believe everyone got the policy on the use of force. You're absolutely right. We need to establish and or maintain control of that person to avoid any injury of the officer involved, of the person who is also the person who's having the attention drawn to, and to those bystanders or those co-employees who are there. Special needs people at times have a disconnect between cause and effect, the pain and what's causing the pain, and it's an unfortunate set of circumstances that occurred at that location. However, when you have one officer there until his backup gets there in order to maintain control, they will be given a, a, another a tasing, so to speak, until that person understands they must comply with the lawful orders of the police officer. I want to just make one further comment on accountability. Uh, Lieutenant Nichols touched on it. We hold our officers accountable to a very high standard. We are an accredited agency. I take great pride in the effort of our officers, our employees. I take great pride in being an agency that has tasers. And once again, I thank this Common Council for providing those tasers to us. It is one tool of many that we use for our, so our officer safety and the, the safety of the public we deal with. We'll get into some injuries later, some statistics on injuries. As far as last year, we had 18 officers injured during the same time of the taser use from April until now, we had nine, injuries, nine officers that were injured. It's reduced our officers' injuries, and it also, I believe, would correspondingly reflect that the public's injuries were also reduced. Thank you, Chief. Alderman Matamara, did you have anything to add? I'm sure I will later. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Could, could you also provide her with the sheet on the mental health study, please? She might like to look at that. 
And uh, Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, in, in the uh, deaths that have occurred, supposedly having to do with tasers around the country, are there any underlying medical conditions? Of course, the officers on the scene wouldn't be able to identify these, but are there any underlying medical conditions that have been shown up in autopsies that perhaps made the heart go into ventricular fibrillation where it just it's not beating properly? Uh, are, th are there any street drugs that perhaps raise blood pressure or make the person more agitated that would perhaps cause a fatal event? If you could just comment on that, please. Okay. Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, the short answer is yes. In other words, if you first let's put this into perspective. Excited delirium, sudden custody deaths are not new. As a matter of fact, the, the earliest medical journal article I know of that exists is from the Journal of Insanity by Dr. Luther Bell. It was published in 1849, which, by the way, that was a little bit before tasers came into being. Additionally, they, it's been widely reported on since the early 1980s during the cocaine epidemic, especially down in Miami. If you check with PubMed on doing research on this issue, there's over 68 published articles on this condition. Now, when you look at this, they almost all have the same phenomenon. It's called in-custody death, excited delirium, sudden death, etc. As far as the taser application, what, without going through a four-hour explanation of this, the things that can happen to these people, either because of drugs or because of past mental illness or because of neuroleptic drugs, it's often called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, excited delirium, agitated delirium, malignant hyperthermia, metabolic acidosis, elevated potassium, rhabdomyolysis, et cetera. When you take all of these things into consideration, what it basically means is the person is acting bizarre in a number of ways, which normally means they have elevated body temperature, which means they will be stripping off their clothing, or they'll be nude in Sheboygan in January. They will be very paranoid. They will usually be breaking glass. They may be attacking people for no reason. There's a whole bunch of symptoms going along with this. And what is basically happening is they are exhausting themselves to death. When you look at the autopsies on these people, after they do die, you will, you will normally find, or oftentimes find, an enlarged heart, or you may find a heart defect, and you will also usually find either a high level of stimulants or what really causes them is chronic stimulant abuse. Now, the, as far as electronic control devices pertains to these people, there are really only three that I know of where the taser was the, listed as a direct cause of death. One of them was the Hasse case out of Chicago, and in that one, our experts, including the head of cardiology for John Hopkins Hospital, say it's impossible, could not have happened because he actually was tasered, and then it wasn't for a couple of minutes later that he succumbed to his problem. He also did have a lethal dose of methamphetamine on board. A second one was a detention person in jail detention down in the Carolinas. He sharpened pencils and attacked one detention officer, shoved the pencil into their skull, and a second one put into their eyeball. So they were now very short on staff. They finally hit him with a taser, and the person ha holding the taser had it locked on, finger pulled for a total 167 continuous seconds. They blamed that one on the taser as well. That one has not gone to litigation yet, so I don't know where it is. So when you look at the current, matter of fact, another article just came out on this yesterday, Michael Curtis here in Wisconsin and other doctors are telling you when these people are exhausting themselves to death, it's like if you, if you, were not, if you or I were to run a marathon, our bodies would shut down before we could exhaust ourselves to death. These people that are on the slope, their dopamine receptors in their brain are damaged to the point they will no longer stop their body from letting them exhaust themselves to death. So therefore, they're on this slippery slope. And what a lot of people are saying now is, look, you've got to get them captured and unconscious as quickly as possible. By that, I mean medically sedate to, in, or, in order to shut their body down to help save their lives. That's the best shot you've got. Now, as far as what you're going to find, in almost every one of these, like I said, you'll find when you do the neurochemistry analysis of the brain, you'll find the damage to the, the dopamine receptors. But a lot of times, you will not even find current drugs in the system. Here's an example for you. This is a documented case in the medical literature. A high school basketball star player all of a sudden dropped dead on the basketball floor. They did an autopsy. They did a complete toxicology screen. They found nothing. They couldn't find anything. So they buried him, no cause of death. About six months later, one of his teammates went to the counselor and said, you know, he'd been doing cocaine every day for months. 
They went and exhumed the body. They did a hair analysis. His hair was about four or five inches long. Your hair is like rings on a tree. If you've done drugs during the length of the hair, you can see it. Sure enough, he was a habitual cocaine user. That's where these people die from. They usually don't die. If, if you're going to die from acute intoxication, that'll show up. You'll see it, et cetera, if it's collected properly. Example on cocaine, I've got one case right now where he died from cocaine, but they did not adequately preserve his blood. They did the autopsy four days later. The problem is the body will continue to metabolize cocaine after death. So they lost that evidence. But anyway, so it's the chronic abuse that causes them to go into the spell, and that's why they could have stopped using meth or coke six months or a year earlier, and they can still have this excited delirium episode. And that's becoming more and, well, more and more well proven now. There's books out on it. There's over 300 articles that I've collected on it from medical journals. It's a well proven fact. And if anybody is truly interested, the Institute for the Prevention of In Custody Deaths is doing a two day symposium in Las Vegas in November, 16th and 17th. And to my knowledge, every one of the top researchers, not just in the U.S., but also in Canada, are going to be there speaking. And they're going to talk about excited delirium, sudden death suicide by police officer. They're going to talk about a whole range of things, including metabolic acidosis, methamphetamine, et cetera. So I hope that answers your Thank question. You. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Hanna. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first off, uh, I like uh, very much the five keys to success you laid out. I think that's, that's very helpful. Um, have you had the opportunity to review our special needs policy uh, within our police department for the use of electronic control devices. Uh, I have second, not. Okay, second question, uh, what do you recommend for ongoing uh, education of our officers in the use of the electronic control device? And finally, when an officer uses a taser or electronic control device, what old device most often does it replace? Might meaning firearm, baton, uh, or pepper spray? Okay, I have, uh, I have not had the opportunity to um, uh, review even your policy, which, uh, which was kind of interesting for me, and I think a good thing because I'm coming in here with no preconceived ideas about what is happening here or even what your policy says. I can tell you uh, what my recommendation would be is this. Um, there are a tremendous amount of good policies in the state of Wisconsin that I have cataloged. Many agencies have used our policy as a model and then have modified it. Uh, they will then send that policy back to me. I look at it, I review it, make some suggestions, send it back, and then I get to keep a copy of it. So our policy keeps, uh, keeps getting uh, better as we go. A lot of things have changed in terms of what uh, Taser, the company, and what their uh, training lesson plan uh, is uh, incorporating right now. I would strongly um, encourage you that as you uh, continue to move forward, if that's what you choose to do, uh, that you get your training or maintain your training uh, as current as possible. A lot of things have changed in the last two years. Um, I was involved in writing um, the latest version, as I said before, of the training manual, and there are a lot of things that we've changed. One of them um, speaks a little bit um, uh, to, to your uh, point earlier. One of the, uh, the options or modes that you can use this device in is called the stun mode, where the only thing that the person gets is the pain compliance portion of it. And it was a technique that was, in my opinion, overemphasized in taser training in years past, where they would take the cartridge off and touch it to the person. The only thing that you get is the pain. You don't get the muscle contraction. So an officer has a person that's resisting. And I think I'm going to sidetrack one, one other thing. Your policy should also say not just active resistance or threat of active resistance. It should. Your policy or your training should say, and there should be some describable threat to you or someone else. There's got to be something more than they just don't want to do what you want them to do. There should be some describable threat to you or someone else. So you have this person that um, is fighting with you. It's uh, some type of a domestic arrest, and the person is actively fighting with you, and you can articulate that threat. If you take that cartridge off of the device and you touch the weapon to them without shooting the probes, the only thing you get is the pain compliance portion. So the officer touches it on him, and if you touch, I, I teach our officers this. With that cartridge removed, think of that device as a blowtorch, okay? Now, if you stick a blowtorch in the middle of somebody's back, what are they going to do? They're going to fight to get away from it. So what does the officer perceive that as? More resistance. So what does the officer do? Applies it again and applies it again. So 
to answer your question, what are one of the things that have been changed? What I see around the country when I do training is agencies that have had the devices for approximately two years will have about 50% of their deployments will be drive stuns. And that was a problem with the training. So we've changed a lot of that. Um, we've talked about a normal cycle is one five second cycle and then reevaluate the threat or the need for another cycle. So you don't have these multiple or continuous cycles. The other key is a very important training item is to teach your officers not to be afraid of the electricity and that they can move in and control the person while the device is on, thus reducing the need for multiple cycles. Um, so the, the key in this is maintaining your, your agency, um, uh, keeping them up to speed on the most current training. There's a few ways that that, that can be done. Taser recommends, the company recommends that the instructors be updated every two years, and I can tell you a lot of things have changed in the last two years. And the last point, sir, I, I got rambling, so I forgot. The last point. Uh, oh, what does it replace? Yes, what does it replace most often? Um, in my opinion, it shouldn't replace anything. It should supplement. However, uh, there comes a point where we can't carry everything on our bat belt. Okay, there's only so much that you can fit on there. Um, what the state of Wisconsin is doing, they are placing the ECD um, within our use of force model, um, and they are placing it at the same um, level of resistance. The, the level is, of resistance that would justify us to use OC spray, pepper spray, is the same level that would justify us to use the ECD. That's where the current state model is. They are also mandating training on excited delirium to, to speak to that. So what many agencies are doing, many agencies are going back to do what us old guys did uh, before the expandable baton, is we carry a baton ring on the belt if I need more room, and I carry a solid baton in my car. So if I'm getting out on the type of call, I think that I may need a baton as opposed to you know other tools, I may then put that baton in. Help me understand the rank the devices that are that are available to police officers from uh, most extreme to, to least extreme so we all understand sure there is a myriad of, of options out there and and you don't need to have every one of them um, what the basic model taught in the state of Wisconsin is you have um, basically a five-tier system presence dialogue empty hand control which are your techniques of uh, pain compliance techniques uh, uh, putting pressure on pressure points that causes pain. You can use joint manipulation. You can use um, uh, punches and kicks and knees and elbow strikes, things like that. Um, you can use pepper spray. And then there's an intermediate weapon, which in the state of Wisconsin, that is the impact weapon, the police baton. Um, and then deadly force. Certainly there are many other options that other agencies will incorporate, mine included, uh, canine units. Where does that fit? It's not in the state model, but you can add additional things, and that's called advanced standing training. Your agency has to research it and have policy on it, and basically that's what it is. So you have multiple multiple options available to you. Um, you should have you should have a variety. You should outfit your officers with as many acceptable force options that have a good balance between effectiveness and propensity to cause injury. And when you look at effectiveness and propensity to cause injury, the ECD is probably one of the best choices that you can, that you can have. Uh, it, it is. Mike? Uh, just two more aspects. As, as far as to address the last one first, uh, if you want it, one of the things I have, I don't have it with me, but I can email it to you easy enough, is a risk reduction PowerPoint. What this is is a collection of police agencies from across the country and the statistical analyses that they've done based upon what they saw in their experience with electronic control devices. So from my perspective, based upon your question, by use of the ECD, what they've seen is a decrease in suspect injury, officer injury, et cetera. But they've also seen example in Miami. Miami, prior to use of the control, uh, taser, had 19 deaths by firearms. For a 16-month period, they had zero deaths by firearms. Just a huge difference. But they see, basically, the agencies that adopt it see decreases in death by firearm, death or canine, batons, pepper spray, and physical force. As you, what you basically see is all of those beginning to decrease. That's what they've seen. As far as training, I do want to hype taser training a little bit because Dave's been through a lot, and there's a number of people in here that have. To me, Taser has the absolute best training in the world. Their hierarchy is as follows. There's a, there's a lead instructor who's the former head of defensive tactics training for the U.S. Marine Corps, hand-to-hand -hand combat. There's a vice president of training who has a staff. Then there are the training board, which Dave is 
been one of the people who's given a huge amount of impact to this. Then there are senior master instructors, master instructors, advanced instructors, instructors, and then users. And right now there's over 22,000 instructors. So Taser, in just the last six years, has put out over uh, 16 different training versions, which keeps getting better and better and better. As far as training, as Dave said, instructors have to go back through the two days of instructor training every two years, and Taser recommends that the user training is every year, and it's for six hours per year. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Chief Shervin had something to add. Just uh, in response to... A just in response to Alderperson uh, Hannah's uh, question and what uh, Lieutenant uh, Nichols uh, mentioned is our policy does address some of the same things as far as it being uh, articulated. Uh, number three, it states an officer shall not brandish, display, or threaten the use of a taser unless he, she can reasonably conclude its use may become justified as an anticipated. After its use or display, the uh, supervisor will fill out a use of force form. One of the things on that form says subject's action. Now we just had one just the other day where an officer was attacked by three people and two people were, were tased. States here, uh, officer assaulted uh, during ar arrest uh, by another party and then another individual uh, jumped in. So this does have, our, our policy does address articulable action uh, on the part of the subject uh, to justify the action. Thank you, uh, Chief Kirk. I'd also like to respond to uh, Alderman Hanna's um, question. Uh, just to, to give you an in-house explanation of what we provide, we provide OC spray, a baton, and a collapsible baton. When they use the taser, if you're trained, it's a mandatory wear a taser, except unless you're in an administrative position where you have some reason where you may not, uh, especially when we don't have one for each officer, we'd rather have those tasers on the street. Now, as we look at, uh, you have to carry OC or baton with a taser. So I think we have about a 50-50 mix. Some carry OC, some carry a baton uh, with their taser. Thank you, Chief. Alderman Susha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do want to thank you for putting this panel together. Um, I think it might have benefited us more if we would have had this type of panel maybe about a year ago before we bought the tasers, um, because I think we could have uh, learned a lot. And I, I just want to clarify, now, Mr. Mr. Bray, you're an attorney, you're not a physician, is that correct? I'm an attorney. I'm also a sworn police officer in the state of Wisconsin and have been since 1976. I'm also certified by the Wisconsin State Post Board to teach 22 different subjects here in the state of Wisconsin. I also have been doing law enforcement risk management, liability management, litigation, expert witness work for the last two decades. I'm also the former chief of intelligence and investigative operations for the Office of Enforcement Operations, U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, as well as former deputy director of the Federal Witness Protection Program for International Ops. I have a lot of weird hobbies. Okay, so I'll take that note of the physician part. You're not a physician, correct? Physician as in medical? Yeah. No. How, uh, I am not a physician as in a, a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. I am the person, though, for the last three years who has been working with and providing expert reports in cases where we have, where Taser has been sued on these issues, and I'm the person who retains the expert, reviews the reports, et cetera, and also works with them. Example, in the Holcomb case in Ohio, we just had 15 expert reports that we filed with that case, including the head of cardiology from Johns Hopkins, the number one electrophysiologist in the United States, uh, et cetera. But no, I am not a medical doctor. Right, and I, I, um, I think that what would have been beneficial perhaps a year ago is now that we've got representation from the police and good representation from Taser with two people on this panel representing uh, someone who helped write the training manual and then also the lawyer that helps defend Tasers, it would be nice if we could have had another panel following with, a, like you said, an electrophysiologist, a cardiologist, an obstetrician, a psychiatrist, maybe a nephrologist, so they could come in and start talking about, you know, what does a diabetic patient look like when they're heading into diabetic shock, and how does that differ from a, a criminal, um, and, and probably work through some of those issues, because that is the part that concerns me the most, is the lack of good medical studies in pregnant women, uh, medical studies with um, patients with cardiac conditions. And, and I think that is a component, and it's also very difficult for an officer to identify. I mean, unless you're maybe five months or longer in your pregnancy, 
you know, the officer's not going to know that. Or heart conditions, you're not going to necessarily know that. And, and you know, it goes down back to what Elder Person Montemayor was saying with the, uh, the mentally handicapped person. Um, there you may have known it, but um, what, what are the interactions with some of the medication that they're on? And I would think that the psychiatry world would sure have some information that uh, the rest of us could benefit from. Uh, because they have used electric shock, and it sure would be interested. I've got mostly medical questions that you're not qualified to answer, but just this meeting could go on until midnight, and I, I think my questions focus more so locally, and I'm going to try to kind of turn the conversation, even though I appreciate the background you've given us. I'd like to turn the conversation into some things that um, are, are more relevant, I think, to what's going on here. Uh, my first question um, well, I have two of them. One is um, I've never received a copy of Sheboygan's taser policy, even though we've asked for it in public protection and safety last um, uh, December. I know that the new public protection and safety committee did go over it, but it would have been nice to have that on our desk tonight. But the, the most um, pressing press question in my mind is um, why, have not, why haven't we implemented the taser cameras yet? I can discuss that um, it hasn't been until recently that the cameras have been out on the market they've been ordered um, that they're coming in um, part of the problem was taser I think had some problems with getting them out but the camera I'm not sure where you want to go with the camera but the the camera is not the end all to the uh, use of the force because part of the problem with the camera is is that camera is not activated until the officer places the taser from a safe mode to an active mode and part of the problem is is you don't put you don't withdraw a taser which is a, a weapon until you're about ready to use it so th that is a problem because leading up to these situations sometimes these situations are so fluid that you're not going to bring a, a weapon out and run the camera so that you can catch the whole action prior to the deployment of, of this so that you can get a whole feel as to what that female or male officer are entailing before they deploy it. That is a problem. So are you telling me that the city of Sheboygan has ordered taser cameras? Yes, we have. Who placed that order? I did. Today. Today? Yes. And could you explain why they weren't ordered um, two months ago when they became available on the market? I don't know exactly when they became available on the market. When we initially ordered the tasers, um, they were put in with the tasers. There was actually a two-bid process on it. It was a, a bid for the tasers that we needed, the X26s, and then also the camera system. And the camera system at that time, we were told that it was not, in, not on the market yet. Mm -hmm. and Chief Crook has something to add to that. I think probably I should answer this question in the sense that uh, when we received the funding for the, the tasers, we purchased the tasers. We also received fund, funding for cameras. When those cameras were known to us to be available, we then placed that order. That order has been sitting for the cameras. There's been a discussion in, with Kim and our department as to when should we place the, the camera purchase. As soon as we find out that those cameras are available, you place the order. The, the order. We talked about this last week. Uh, Kim was not working last week, I believe that's the case. When we found out those cameras were available, that's when we placed the order. Thank you, Chief. And that is something that we had brought up in public protection safety also, and uh, we were kind of on top of that. Uh, just to address a couple things. Uh, first, if you like, I, will put, I can put you in touch with, at no cost to you, a number of medical doctors, and you can talk to them at your to get your answers to any questions you may have. Secondly, just so you know, Taser since December of 2005 has been running about one a month, what we call a Taser Chiefs, Risk Managers, and Attorneys program. We've done them. We just did one in Chicago. It seems like a year ago was last week. But anyway, there, we had about 150 people in attendance. At those programs, it's a two-day program, we had Dr. Jeff Ho, who's a medical emergency room doctor who's also done the latest leading research on electronic control devices and the effects on the human, human being over the last 
two years. We also had Dr. Mark Kroll, who Dr. Mark Kroll is a PhD, but he holds over 200 patents on cardiac electrical devices. He is the man in the world for that subject. We also had Scott Greenwood, who's an ACL, ACLU attorney out of Ohio. We also had a representative from the Institute for Prevention and Custody Deaths. So we do put on these programs. The next one is scheduled for uh, Oakland, California in November, but we do do that. But as far as any medical questions you might have, whether it be on excited delirium, effects of electricity on the body, effects of electricity on the heart, I will be more than happy. If you wish, I'll give you a selection to choose from, and you tell me which ones you want to contact or even don't, and I'll pave the way, and you can talk to as many of them as you want. And I'll rephrase. I can't say that. I know about 40 to 50 of them, and you can have your pick, whichever ones interest you the most. Thank you. Alderman Susha, did you have anything to add? Uh, I would just like to say thank you for that opportunity, but I have spoken to several local physicians, and they are not as uh, positive and optimistic as you and the other paid employees by Taser International. So, but thank you for the offer. Uh, I do need to respond to that. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I understand that. However, I, j just to put it in perspective, I have deposed four medical examiners in the last month, and it's interesting after they make certain statements on autopsies, et cetera, they know nothing about electricity. They know nothing about how electricity affects the body other than extreme electrocution. They know nothing about, very, very little about excited delirium, sudden death, metabolic acidosis, all these other issues. They don't know those. And I, I, if you want the depositions, I'll even provide them to you. And example, one in the Holcomb case down in Ohio, medical examiner said, two of them said, taser was a contributory cause of death. In the Holcomb case, they even put in a press release that Taser would not have killed him had it not been for the meth on board. I'll be more than happy to provide you with Dr. Deans and Dr. Oh, whatever the other one was, but both of their depositions, they know nothing about electricity, they know nothing about the effect on the body, they knew nothing about tasers, they knew nothing about excited delirium, they did not do a neurochemistry exam. When asked, okay, what was the mechanism by which the Taser device contributed, I don't know. What is the lowest percentage you would give us on how much you believe the taser contributed? 0 0.000000001%. The bottom line is local physicians, unless they've studied this topic in depth, do not know it. And I would, I would bet that against almost any of them. And like I said, I can provide the depositions, the expert reports, the transcripts, whatever you need. Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I think what the problem is here is that these electrical devices have not been studied to the full extent. I think they were put on the streets too soon. In this country, we have 150 people that have died since June of 01 after being tasered. We have a man in McWanago that died in, in May. It turned out he was tasered 12 times. The autopsy showed he had no medication of any kind in his system. Right now, we have researchers in Madison using pigs as their subjects, and in May, one did die. Now, Amnesty International has asked that law enforcement pull these devices, these 50,000 volt electrical charge devices, off the streets until all this research can come in and we will be having educated, um, something to base things on. And if they are so safe, why has Taser International settled $20 million in lawsuits as of today? Thank you. Okay, you ready? Number one, let me address the researcher in Madison. That is Dr. John Webster. He's a very knowledgeable man. He's a very good man. We deposed him last Thursday. Here is, here is what he said, and I will be more than happy to provide you with his deposition. I have a rough draft of it now. If you want the phone, I'll give it to you. His latest research report said the chance of causing VF, ventricular fibrillation, from a Taser X26 is 0 0.00014. No, I'm sorry, there's four zeros. 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, 1, 4. That is the chance of getting VF from a Taser device. Now, that also assumes, A, it's an incredibly thin individual. There's no one in this room that has a thin enough, uh, 
I'm not saying you're heavy, that's not what I'm saying. But the problem is that the, the barb on the taser is nine millimeters, it's, it's about three, three eighths of an inch. It has to penetrate all the way through, it has to be at a direct, direct angle, it has to go between the ribs, it has to go between the cartilage, between the ribs, and then it has to be at the bottom of the respiratory cycle. Dr. Webster, in, to put this into perspective as far as nationwide, nationwide as far as potential for death, he said in his deposition, in order for someone in the U.S. to get VF from a taser, it is point zero 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 zero. That's that's eight zeros. One four. That is one point four out of one hundred million. Now, and that that assumes that the taser goes totally into the body, no clothing. It assumes it goes straight in, not at an angle. It assumes it goes all the way into the nine millimeter mark. That's in his testimony in his deposition from last week. Now. 150 people died since 91, or since 90. That number comes from the Arizona Republic, and the actual number is 167. However, when you do the analysis, what it says is 167 people died after being tasered. If you look at some of the statistics that the chief has on the studies that have been done, people have been dying from excited delirium type events for many years. In a 12-month study that was done, uh, whatever, 160, whatever that was checked, there was only 30% of the times the taser was even present. The taser is not killing these people. If you look at those 167, here's what you'll find. Out of that 167, one, one was the direct cause of death. 18, it was listed as contributory. Now let's talk about contributory. The two medical examiners we deposed two weeks ago, one of them, Dr. Haynes, said, yes, I listed as a contributory because it also included stress, so therefore the stress contributed to the death. And this is someone who his father called the police because he was high on meth. Actually, he had a toxic level on board. He had been throwing their furniture out of the house, including up on the roof in other neighbor, people's neighborhoods, et cetera. So, and then also, if you look at 167, there are approximately 10 where they said they couldn't rule out the taser. Couldn't rule it in. They couldn't rule it out. There's a study that has been done. It has not been published yet. That will basically show there's only, out of that 167, there's only two that are even in question. Now, as far as studies. No other law enforcement device has ever been studied as much as TASER, and if you talk to the medical professionals, they will tell you medical devices are not tested as much as TASER. If you wish it, I can provide you with over 3,000 pages just on TASER testing from multiple countries. The Home Office in the United Kingdom, which unlike here in the States, in, in Britain, there's one office that controls all the police. They spent over $4.5 million testing TASERs, and they basically said they are safe for their intended purpose. The Canadian Police Research Center, their two last reports that came out in, in June and August of 2005, they both said there's absolutely no causal link between the taser and death. We have over 80 such studies in our possession. I can provide them to an electronic format. be happy to do so. Also, we have over 300 articles on excited delirium, methamphetamine, cocaine, toxicity, chronic and acute, et cetera, that do cause death. I can provide those to you as well. The bottom line is there's absolutely no causal connection between tasers and death period, if, you, if the homework is done and if all the facts actually come out. That's why, as far as lawsuits, we're at 23 and 0. Now, the $20 million settlement, where that came from was because back in January of 05, the stock was manipulated in order to cover shorts. What a short is, you know how we all bet on stock? In other words, I buy stock, we hope it goes up, we sell it. What a short does is buys high or borrows it high and then hopes it goes down and it takes a profit in the meantime. What happened was information was inappropriately leaked to the New York Times. That got a front page article in January of 05. That article, eight months later, they denounced it and said it never should have been published. But that started the U.S. Department of Justice to start an investigation. Within one day after that was announced, Taser was sued by a group of 61 different attorneys across the country in a securities and exchange class action lawsuit on two issues. Issue one was the medical safety of Tasers. Issue two was the immense drop in the, the taser stock. On the medical issue of, of tasers, the U.S. Department of Justice in December of 05 said no further action because we sent over 100,000 pages of documentation, proof, etc. No further action. The Arizona Attorney General said the same thing. The $20 million, it was real simple. They went into a settlement conference approximately two months ago. Plaintiffs, all these plaintiffs attorneys from across the country wanted $320 million. They walked out with 20. Why did they walk out with 20? Because they were threatening five years of litigation. They were going to go to every one of our customers and drag the chief and others into litigation and force them into deposition and everything else, and we weren't about to let our customers go through that. So that's what that was. That wasn't to settle taser injury cases. That was to settle 
the Securities and Exchange Commission litigation was brought forth in January of 2005 that all got started by the New York Times that was later denounced that the U.S. Department of Justice even said there's no basis for any further action. That's where all that flowed from. Thank you. Alderman Kittleson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't know if there are people who would like to respond to that, but I wanted to go on to a different uh, topic. With the, I wanted to ask Chief Kirk about the policies and procedures. I, I think we were given a manual that was put on our desk, and I wondered if, if this is the current policy and procedure manual, and <clears throat> how often is that reviewed, and have there uh, any changes been made? It was dated um, April 3rd of this year, and that was, I believe, put on our desk. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, there should have been a manual or policies placed on everyone's desk. They were asked, and we, we were, people were told to place them on the desk. As far as other committees that received these, we provided policies whenever asked. Uh, the uh, reevaluation date is an annual note on the policy. Uh, it was put into effect in April, on April 3rd of this year, and on an annual basis. Any other issues as far as policy and the development, uh, as was stated before, uh, we are an accredited agency. We do uh, policy development, and we ask those who are knowledgeable in the area to go out and seek other policies. Uh, I am sure we have used Appleton's uh, policy. We conform with the uh, state of Wisconsin's uh, defense and arrest tactics policy. So uh, we, we do not try to uh, reinvent the wheel. We certainly grab any policies from any <coughs> agencies that uh, apply, and then we sit down with those knowledgeable. For example, Tim Eyrick was, was a huge role in the policy development of tasers. Thank you. Just so everybody knows, I got, I've always had like five lights here. I'm just taking them as people, people ask. So Alderman Montemar. Um, thank you, Chairman Vanderweel. Um, the Sheboygan Police Department directive is what is policy? It, okay, so that's what you're talking about. Um, I thank Lieutenant Nichols for giving us some good information about <coughs> policies and things. How close is this directive to the policy business that you were talking about? Are you speaking to me, ma'am? Yes, yes, please. Um, I haven't had a chance to review it. I can look at it very uh, quickly. However, the language that he read to you before about the uh, uh, shall not be brandished or displayed is directly the same language as out of our policy, so I'm assuming it's, it's based heavily on ours, but I will, I will review it very quickly. I appreciate that because I like the, the things that you were saying that um, it should be used when it's necessary not for punishment. Absolutely. And, and um, I would hope that, you know, after you look at that, and I would guess there would be some more things that we'd need to add to that, or review, or newer things that we should add to that, I would like to, that this committee would recommend that our police department do that within the next 30 days, get an up-to-date, comprehensive policy that would meet all that criteria and maybe also in, include in that some of the continuing education things that, that our officers may be going through when it comes to the use of tasers. And maybe not, I don't know if I want to use the word sensitivity training, but the training <coughs> of special needs people, which are varieties of special needs. I'd be more than, uh, more than willing to provide, I have uh, five or six policies that I consider model policies um, from around the state. Um, they'd be happy to share. Uh, I also have a, um, a, I think, a very good uh, PowerPoint program on uh, the medical emergencies, as, uh, as was brought up before, recognizing that some of these incidents are not criminal behavior. It's medical emergency, and they need to be treated that way. Be happy to share that information as I get it, and um, I, you, know, you can look at your policy and update it as, as necessary. One of the key elements that many agencies missed early on was uh, simply uh, having a policy that said active resistance or a threat of active resistance. And, and I'll give you one example. Um, I think we're, you end up with uh, kind of a term that we've coined or I've coined in the training I do. If you just simply say resistance or threat of active resistance, um, you end up with lawful but awful uses of the device. Um, what you need to do is have a policy that not only spells out what active resistance or threat is, but that you must describe some type of threat of harm to you or someone else. If you have, for instance, a, um, uh, a person who, a police officer goes and says, sir, you're under arrest for this warrant, 
and that person slams his fist on the table and uses some expletives and says, I'm not going with you, and if you attempt to take me, I'm going to hurt you. Um, and he's that size and, you know, these kind of factors. I think that we can certainly articulate a physical fight is uh, a threat of harm. In Wisconsin, we don't have to, and we're directed to always maintain a position of, van of advantage. If the person wants to wrestle with us, we aren't supposed to wrestle with them. Okay, the second situation, and could we use it on that person according to your policy? Yes, and I think it would be appropriate. Now you get sent to the elementary school to the fifth grade emotional disabilities class, and Johnny needs to go see a social worker, and you say, Johnny, come with me, and he slams his fist on the table, uses expletives to you, and says that he's going to hurt you if you try and do that. If your policy simply says threat of active resistance, is that by definition a threat of active resistance? My, I, I think by definition it is, but where is there a describable threat of harm to you or anyone else? So, I mean, that's where your training and your and your uh, policy must be very clear. So I'd be happy to provide that. Uh, just one minute. Deputy Chief Sherman, you had something to add? Just uh, in response to your question, Alder Person. Just in response to your question, Alder Person, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what uh, uh, Lieutenant Nichols was talking about is we can address that exactly in what we have in our policy. The taser is analogous to OC spray on the disturbance resolution model and may be used by trained officers when a subject is threatening to actively resist or is actively resisting an officer and the subject poses an articulable threat of harm to an officer or to another person. It may also be used when a subject poses a threat of harm to himself or herself as inflicting injury or a suicide attempt. So I believe that addresses it uh, exactly what Lieutenant Nichols was talking about. And that's the exact language from our policy. Okay. But could I make a recommendation that, or a motion to recommend that this committee ask to have up to date, very up to date and with also a policy, maybe with a little more language in the, what, and there's a lot of language here, but even with a little bit more language in that we have, than we have here, specifically addressed to the special needs people. I guess, I guess I'd like to address that as part of the special needs. In this particular case that we keep coming back at the rehabilitation center where there's this concern, there was 10 professionals there. They couldn't handle the person. They're not going to, they're, they're calling the police because they've got to deal with the violence. The police aren't going to be able to have all this training combined that these special professionals are going to have and not have an all-knowing answer. They have to be, the police are there to protect the safety of everyone, including the, uh, the individual himself. And I think we have to keep that in mind when we're addressing the special needs. I understand that. And I meant other special needs, like, like Alderman Susha said, pregnant or other things. And I would guess that in your training, I would hope that you have addressed those things other than just the bad guys out in the street that give you a lot of trouble. Yes, we have. We, our officers are first responders medically. Put it in here. They're, they're, they're first responders medically. They, they have the CPR training. They have medical training in how to deal with, with things, uh, diabetes, things on that order. We have some officers that were, were emergency medical, medical technicians when we used to have the ambulance service. So officers do have training as far as, as, far as medical needs, first responding training. The, I meant in relation to taser use. The, uh, excuse me, the lesson plan from... Uh, for your instructors does include um, a very significant in length PowerPoint presentation that deals with um, uh, deploying the device on subjects who are pregnant, um, on things like that. That is addressed in training. I would, um, you know, the, the policy development is certainly uh, uh, up to the, the people from the department here, but you want to be careful not to make your policy a training manual, otherwise you'll be, it'll be very difficult to, um, to comply with your own policy, but that, I, I, they can provide you with that PowerPoint, which addresses much of what you're talking about. They, they do get that information in their training session. Thank you. Um, we'll vote on that motion, but first I'd like to get everybody else who's waiting here. Uh, Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Lieutenant Nichols and Lieutenant Bray for being here today. I think both of you gentlemen are uh, uh, very well qualified in your field. And I, I think your knowledge, uh, your, your education in the use of tasers is uh, beyond question. Um, 
First of all, I think what we need to point out here is a taser is part of the police department's array of weapons. Uh, it's not a something that is used first. Um, basically what it is, it's another deterrent to violence. Uh, if I look here on our stats, uh, over 50% of the times that a taser was displayed, it wasn't used. And it was only displayed <coughs> when there was a threat to of bodily harm for the officer or another person. That, that is policy along with, with other weapons that the police department has. Um, I th would think the the next day after an incident, the average person would rather uh, wake up um, with the memory, a bad memory of being tased rather than waking up with a lump on their head from being struck with a baton. Or worse, wake up with a, uh, or not wake up after a use of uh, deadly force. So I think what we need to, to really look at is, is what the weapon is all about and how it's being used. And uh, I, th I think that this, this panel is telling us that uh, it is being used properly and professionally in our police department. Um, it is a deterrent. It is, it is not, it, it, is, it is meant as a deterrent. As, as Alderman, Alderperson Matamayor said, uh, when people see it, they generally comply. And I, I believe that, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, as a council, um, we should uh, second guess our police department on this issue um, when and I, I believe it has been used uh, properly and I believe it should uh, be used properly in the future. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just looking at some of the statistical reports that were placed on our desk, and um, there's a one-page summary from April 22nd through October 8th, and I'm, I'm assuming this is the most up-to-date one compared to the other two reports that we have. Would that be accurate? The uh, lengthy document there is provided by the police department. The condensed version comes out of the mayor's office. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, well, thank you for providing this. I guess one of my one of my concerns is that we have one of the reports is dated September 7th, and then we have another one. It doesn't have a date on it, but it's stamped that it was received in the mayor's office on October 9th. And from what I can tell, it looks like just based on that, we, we're almost using it, the taser, every other day. Are there any statistics showing how that compares to other communities of our size? Is that normal to be using it every other day? Is that less often than other communities, or is that more often? Uh, first off, if I could just I, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that we've seen on a national basis is that a lot of times the taser is deployed in approximately 1% or less of the arrests. So what I would like to see, too, is how many incidents of arrest has the agency had over the same time frame. But it's just as a guide. Thank you. And then I have another question about the, the reports on our desk, if I may follow up. Um, three children under the age of 16, how old were the kids when you tased them? Once again, that comes out of the mayor's office. That that uh, I'd have to uh, reflect that one to uh, Lieutenant Eric. Our records show that um, there was a 15-year-old Asian male that the weapon was displayed at, but was never deployed. Um, there was a 15-year-old Hispanic male that the weapon was displayed at, but it was never deployed. And the other one was a 14-year-old um, white male where the weapon was uh, used in a drive stun without the cartridge um, by an officer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess what I'd like to see is in looking at these statistics here, and first off, what's the difference between an Asian male or a Hispanic male or a white male? They're people. I mean, women, men, doesn't make any difference to me. But 
when I take a look at this, I'd like to see statistics from last year before the tasers on what type of force or whatever you need to do to take somebody to custody. So whether it was a baton or pepper spray, you know, kind of a year to day for the same period, and then compare that to the taser, uh, to just as a comparison. Um, because I think that might shed a little bit more light onto this um, for me as to what, what these actually, you know, the, the situations of course probably a little bit different from time to time, but at least there's something to compare it to. How many times did you use a baton or pepper spray at the same period last year were using the tasers this year? That's something that I would like to see on this. And then the other question I would have would be for the lieutenant. Um, with the cameras on the tasers, when we finally get them, would that be a training tool for, for the future to go back and take those cameras into the training room and show these officers that this is the situation, whatever we have on the camera, of course. I mean, you're not going to get the full incident up there. Would that be a good training tool? First off, I can address some of those issues. Uh, this taser report statistics form, uh, this came out of uh, conversations that the mayor and I have had. It's been revised multiple times, and this data it takes either the lieutenant, the deputy chief, or our secretaries to read these documents to determine and provide you this information. So some of this information, uh, please allow us some time and please provide us what you want because this, this has been changed numerous times. And we attempt to provide as much information on there. And as we were looking at this tonight before the meeting, uh, we noticed that we don't even have the date of incident on here, which may be, I mean, another piece of information that could be of, of importance. Um, uh, so with that, um, this, as um, Alderman Susha has indicated there, she's got different dates on some of the reports. Well, that's been a work in progress, um, changing what's needed, what would you like next, things of that nature. Uh, second off, uh, with cameras on tasers, of course, it could be a training tool. <coughs> uh, and if I could just say, I've had uh, quite a few aldermen call me and ask me to put certain things on the agenda, questions they have for uh, the police department or Chief Kirk, and, and I put them on the agenda. And if you ever have any questions, just give me a call. I'll respond real quickly to your question about the camera. Um, and all you're going to get is an opinion uh, because, and uh, you know, I mean, it's debatable. The city of Appleton chose not to go with the cameras, and that was mainly because of my input. Um, the lieutenant uh, probably used the exact words that I would have used uh, when describing the camera systems. The problem with the camera system is it is not activated until the weapon is turned on and pointed at the person. Our agency provides uh, in-car camera systems and an audio system to our officers, and I don't want our officers using a weapon as a camera. Um, I was concerned with that. The one advantage that I think it will provide, though, is the follow-through procedures and the necessity for multiple cycles and things like that. So I think it has significant value. Um, we, so it, it really provides, it's a decision that you need to, need to make. Our agency chose not to do it. The other thing that I was concerned with is things happen very quickly, as the lieutenant said, and sometimes you, uh, are the, you are the recipient of a sudden assault. The person's talking to you, and the next thing, they're coming at you. You get it out of the holster, turn it on. There's a short delay before it even starts to record, and the only thing you're going to see for justification for that officer deploying the device it may be a half-second window of a person coming at them without all the words that preceded it or what we call pre-attack postures and things like that. And, and that can be an issue. Um, but I think it does, um, it does provide some great benefit for was there necessity for multiple cycles and, and how could we do this better? So that, that's uh, kind of a, a both ways answer on it. I would ask that um, we agreed to, to buy cameras for these items to get them on the road. Uh, we have purchased, or we have ordered these cameras. If in fact you want to listen to uh, Lieutenant Nichols and not go with the cameras because of some of the concerns and flaws, that we allow that dollar amount, $8,000, <laughs> to be used to purchase approximately nine more units or nine more tasers so we have more tasers available to our officers on the road, the ones that need them. 
Thank you, Chief Kirk. Uh, Alderman Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have two questions, um, which I think will address the real reason why we're here tonight is concerning this one incident. Number one, does our current policy address or is sensitive to individuals which um, Alderperson Montemayor has cited? And secondly, did we adhere to that policy in this incident? Um, I will be voting against this motion. Um, I think there's a danger that we can become emotional given each particular incident that we use a taser in and try to gear it towards such. I would be much more comfor comfortable than having um, Lieutenant Nichols provide um, more than five minutes of looking over our policy. And if you see any suggestions, offering that to our department. Could I just address uh, several issues here? Uh, first on the policy. Our policy is as current as it's going to be for the time being. And if anything new does come out, we immediately address it, and it's immediately given out to all officers. Um, and right now, I don't know if there's anything. When I put the policy together, I think I read nine different policies throughout the state, and Appleton was one. And I believe I stole a lot of this information out of there. Like the chief said, I don't want to remake the wheel. Um, so I would have to say ours is right now is the most current it is in this form. That doesn't mean that next week something doesn't come out or something new doesn't come out from the state that we won't immediately put into our policy. Um, as it has to do with this incident, with the um, incident at RCS, I want to be a little careful because this is still an uh, open case. It still has to go to court to be adjudicated. Um, but when this incident occurred, it occurred on my shift. It was one of my officers. Um, the officer that was involved is one of the finer street officers we have on this department. Um, when he arrived at this scene, he did not immediately draw that taser and shoot the individual to put him into compliance. That officer talked to the people that were there, found out what the situation was, he was told that if you try to talk to the individual calmly, you might be able to calm him down. The officer immediately went over to him and talked to him calmly. Tried, addressed him by his first name, told him he was a police officer, he was there to try to help him, he needed to calm down, and we need to rectify the situation. He talked to him for some period of time, I can't tell you exactly how long, but it was a normal tried conversation. At that point, the individual then spit in the officer's face. The officer still remained calm. He still tried to settle him down, he tried to talk to him. The taser didn't even enter his thought process at this point. It wasn't until that individual started directing his behavior, not towards the officer, but started directing it towards other individuals within the RCS building. Understand that this individual did not belong at the RCS building. He was not a member of RCS. He was there with another uh, a caretaker who I believe was picking up another member. So RCS doesn't even have him as a client. At that point, the officer felt for the safety of individuals, and you got to remember that some of these individuals that were at RCS are wheel-bound chair people who cannot defend themselves. This individual was striking out at everything and anything that he could get at. It, lay, it did not give the officer any opportunity other than what he felt was to use a taser. You can argue that maybe we could have used pepper spray. But pepper spray in a lot of these situations, like uh, previously stated, was not a good option. Using a nightstick was not a good option. And it, lay, it gave the officer only one option. The problem is one officer was initially sent there. The other officers that were assisting coming to help him were minutes out. He had to act in that situation. Otherwise, I think without due diligence, someone else would have been injured. And that, in, and that person couldn't have defended themselves. And, and therefore, he selected the best option he had at that time. And remember, these situations are, are very fast. We can now sit back, and we can sit here and dissect the thing in every which way we can figure out, because we got time. But in those types of situations, they happen so rapidly, the officer doesn't have a lot of time. He has to work on his experience and what he knows is in front of him. Thank you. Is there any other questions for the panel? With that, I'd like to thank Lieutenant Nichols and Mr. Brave for coming here and sharing their 
their knowledge and time. Thank you very much. And uh, so we have a motion on the floor. And um, Alderman Montemar, could you repeat the motion and tell us where you'd want it to go? A policy issue, discussing policies, should go to public protection and safety, I believe. Well, I would make a... I would like that it would go to council. Uh, we would have a favorable recommendation to go to council that the policy be brought very much up to date, have um, Lieutenant Nichols help with that. Um, and then it also in that policy, address the, ins address the, the issue of maybe, I hate the word sensitivity training, but you know what I'm talking about. And continue in education if the special needs people, not just this one gentleman at RCS, but diabetic or anything like that when it comes to use of taser because it's going to be those odd problems where there's going to be a true damage not the regular tough guy on the street it's going to be the the problems that you don't see every day the the the, the people who have have special needs that I hope you'll recognize or figure it out or something um, a policy that will talk about that and I don't know, maybe work together with the mayor or something to put it together. That's an awfully long motion, but you know what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Uh, Chief Kirk, you had something to say? I guess as far as the, the, uh, the motion is concerned, I think you have to look at and what uh, Lieutenant Eric has indicated. Lieutenant Eric indicated he's reviewed nine different policies from around the state. He's been trained by Lieutenant Nichols. We did look at Appleton's policies. Our, up, our policies are updated on a regular basis. This is it's, it's reviewed annually by our staff. We've had it now for about six months. Any time that there are changes, they are addressed immediately when possible in policy. I think first stated that, uh, as uh, Lieutenant Eric indi indicated, this is as current as possible at the present time. Will we address these changes that need to be addressed? Well, certainly we will. We have a, a policy book that contains approximately, I'm guessing now, about 100 policies. So there's, this is not the only policy that we have, and medical issues and concerns <laughs> are addressed in other policies. So. Is Lieutenant Nichols recognized as one of the regional best? Well, yes, of course. That's why we asked him to come here today. That's why we sent our lieutenant to him to be trained. He's a product of Lieutenant Nichols. That's why we had uh, Mike Brave come here today to provide you any answers. Now, I would also address, if you have any questions as far as the heart, the pacemaker, things of this nature, these issues have been raised before. Please address those before we go tonight. Thank you, Chief. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't believe it's necessary to change a policy or to update a policy that is already current. Uh, as uh, Lieutenant Irick said, this policy is less than six months old. He's studied policies from <coughs> all over the place. The, the policy regarding use of force um, is not only dealing with tasers, it's dealing with, with all levels of force. And uh, I'm sure that the police department has addressed um, special needs people, um, people with medical conditions. Um, I, 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 I know that the average officer would recognize if a, a woman was X amount of months pregnant and <clears throat> act accordingly. So I do not believe at this point uh, to try to change the police department's policy when it doesn't need to be changed is nothing more than an opportunity for, for this council to grill our police department once again. So I'm going to vote against this. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Uh, Mayor Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to ask uh, Lieutenant Nichols, as Alderman Montemayor was saying, that perhaps she feels uh, quite strongly that our policy although some refer to it as current, that uh, it, should be, it should include some sort of uh, standards for, for, for not only detecting or noticing or dealing with people with uh, special needs, et cetera. Uh, I notice you nodding your head. Uh, I, I would take that there was an, an agreement. Is there anything wrong? First of all, that's a two-pronged question. Does your policy in Appleton have anything like that? And secondly, if it does or doesn't, 
is there anything wrong with a policy addressing that issue? It's not asking for a lot, at least in my mind, to, to, uh, to ease the public as to the, uh, the, the coverage, so to speak, that our policy would provide to uh, people who, who aren't particularly identified in, in the policy. My, an my answer to that question was be, would be this. I think it is very important to address it, but not necessarily in policy. I believe that what you're talking about is a training issue. It needs to be, you need to have the most current and up-to-date training, and TASER has updated their training in the last couple of years, and there are some significant changes that have occurred, and some of those things, like, like in my training, as I shared with you earlier, we added to TASER's training to deal with elevated justification when you're dealing with an emotionally disturbed person, when you're dealing with somebody in uh, a medical crisis, that um, that type of thing should be addressed in training, not necessarily policy. I've read um, your policy, and, um, and I think it's a, a good policy. I haven't studied it for an hour, but I think it is a very good and current policy. There may be some other changes that are, there may be some other uh, pieces of information from other policies that I have from around the state that maybe the lieutenant didn't have, he can look at and consider those. But I think you have a very solid policy. I think the issues, the main issues I'm hearing here are critical training issues, not necessarily policy issues. It's very difficult to put in policy an all-exclusive list or all-inclusive list, excuse me, of special needs or of medical conditions. And I think that, that's more a training issue than a policy issue. I, I think what I gather from the, the motion here, though, is they would like, the alderman would like for you to take a look at it, make the recommendations. If you have none, fine. But if you do, and those recommendations will be incorporated into the policy as it stands now and perhaps make it better, if there aren't any, all that's required is say, to me, it's okay. But to vote a motion down simply because we're assuming already yeah. And we ha you haven't had an opportunity to look at it. Not only have you not had an opportunity to look at it, you're very willing to help us out. And I really appreciate that because I'm really impressed with your knowledge and, and your, your uh, open mind is about situations uh, that, that deal with the use and non-use of tasers. So I, there's nothing wrong with asking you, this council, asking you, take a look at it. You may come back and say, perfectly all right, but I had plenty of time to look at it. Or you may come back and say, you know what, maybe if you add just this one thing, it'll make it a lot better. I would be happy to do that. I'd be honored to do that. And uh, I would uh, certainly also invite the opportunity to look at the training lesson plan that's currently being used to train the officers and, and make some recommendations at Thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Brook. President Brook. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. I, given that we've got an agreement of... Uh, evaluating policies, I guess I don't know that that needs a formal motion of the council. It seems like that seems to be reasonable due diligence. I guess the problem I have with the uh, motion relates, in many ways, we spent a lot of time talking about training. My training is, a, is as a psychologist. For many years, uh, my primary job function was management and supervision of public sector mental health services, specifically dealing with individuals uh, uh, who uh, would be confronted by the police under Chapter 5120 or Chapter 55. In other words, an individual who presented with behaviors such that they were dangerous to themselves or others. In our state, and virtually all states, the only individual who can take such an individual into protective custody is a sworn officer. Psychologist can't do it, social worker can't do it, a psychiatrist can't do it. We need a police officer. I guess in my Several years of experience in doing that, I've always been impressed with the sensitivity of all of the local departments and how they've approached situations like that. If there were situations where danger presented either to that individual or to the officer, uh, typically I felt that their use of force was appropriate and measured and that they used whatever verbal techniques they could to try and, if you would, um, deal with the situation before moving up the continuum of force. The difficulty I find is defining what is special needs. You need to look at the behavior of the individual and what they're presenting, not their diagnosis. Because a diagnosis is something you may not have available. And I think it still comes down to what behavior 
does the officer or the individual confront when they see the individual? And over, I guess, my time in public sector mental health, I've again been impressed and trusted the sensitivity that law enforcement has shown to situations where an individual may be under extreme stress or duress or experiencing a significant mental health problem. So uh, again, I, I don't see the need to address that in policy. Thank you. Thank you, President Berg. Alderman Verhessel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can't speak for those making the motion. However, I guess myself, after looking at the policy, I wouldn't mind a little bit more detail, a little bit more comprehensive detail. Um, for instance, um, do we shoot the taser at fleeing suspects? Yes or no. Do we shoot the taser at pregnant suspects? Yes or no. You know, what is, of course we can't hit every possibility, like Elman Berg said, that's a pretty broad range when we talk about special needs, but if we could address some of the obvious and more common possibilities, I think that is something I'd feel more comfortable with. Um, to me, I mean, it was suggested earlier that putting too much information there, I, or I guess it was suggested that every time we look at an incident, we're revisiting this whole emotional roller coaster of how, how we used it or not. And I guess if we do have a more comprehensive policy, to me, that takes the emotion out of the entire argument. The more detail, the more that's in writing, the less we're there to you know, be suspicious about. So I think it would be behoove the department maybe to have a little bit more detail in there and take the emotion out of it and the argument out of it. Thank you, Alderman Verhassel. When, when we start talking about policy and looking into it, having people review it is one thing, but when we need to be careful we don't start micromanaging and say this is what you need, this is what you need, because that is what our department heads are for. Alderman Hanna. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, a couple things. I, last week I shared with the, with the mayor an article from the Wall Street Journal which indicated that unfortunately there's a growing trend uh, for special needs individuals to be out and about in the community. So I do support that the, we need to increase our training to recognize behaviors and respond appropriately. And again, also, let's make sure the policy's uh, comprehensive and up to date. Um, I agree. I don't want to micromanage policies. I'm actually more concerned that training is uh, at the peak level. Thank you, Alderman Hanna. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when you look at the, the training section, I mean, I'm just am borrowing Alderperson Montemayor's document right now. You know, I see an awful lot about force. It talks about use of force, firearm proficiency, firearm training, you know, certified weapons instructor. What I think is missing in the training is um, something relating to interpersonal skills. I mean, you do have it on the continuum that you do talk about um, dialogue and uh, things like that, but it's not in the training. You're not getting into the interpersonal skills where you actually talk to the people to try to work through their issues. It does sound like the example that uh, Lieutenant Eirich talked about that with the RCS person that they did do a very good job of communicating with them. But Alderman Hanna is correct. We're trying to mainstream a lot more of these folks that weren't on the street five years ago. And I think as, as society is changing, we have to take that into account. And, you know, putting it in the training uh, for the tasers would be a good place, and perhaps in, in other different uh, segments, we could also do more training. Uh, in addition to working on interpersonal skills, perhaps even bringing in uh, a psychiatrist to address the officers to talk about psychotic behavior and um, some of the, the things that might set people off or the do's and don'ts and things like that, that might also be beneficial. Um, whether that specific needs to be put into uh, the taser training, um, I'm not sure, but I, I really think that some interpersonal skills training would be warranted and it would be just one little sentence that they could add to training. Um, I'm going to get Lieutenant Eirik first and then I'll, I'll give you. I guess um, when you talk about interpersonal training, I'm not sure what you're getting at because you're looking at, right now, we, we started discussing tasers here tonight, and you're looking at a, a list of about 50 deployments. But I think you're missing the big picture here. And the big picture is is that the Sheboygan police officers have roughly about 70,000 complaints we handle a year. That's not including all the non-stamped um, complaints we go to. So if you're talking about interpersonal skills, you get some of the finest officers in the state here talking to people not using force, using nothing but their dialogue and, and getting people to comply. And I, it's an ongoing process that all officers go through in interpersonal skills. Um, it's called experience, it's called maturity, it's called learning from your partners, 
um, what works good and what doesn't work good. Um, we do do they do do a lot of training. It's my understanding at the um, in um, recruit school level, we do some training at in service uh, on on a um, uh, yearly basis. So the officers are ongoing. I, I guess I'm, I'm I'm a little lost because. For the vast majority, the vast majority of the times, the officers are, are using outstanding skills as interpersonal skills, but you're just looking at a very, very small piece of the puzzle that the officers are dealing with. These are the highly charged, highly emotional situations that the officers are dealing with, and they have actually gone through a list. They've tried to calm the person down. They've tried to talk them down. They've tried to do other things, um, and it gets to a point that they have nothing else to use but the other tools they have on their belt. Um, so for to give officers more training at that, training is always good, but I, I hope this council doesn't come away with this attitude that the Sheboygan police officers do not have any interpersonal skills or aren't ongoingly trained in interpersonal skills because they are. Thank you, Mr. Bray. Just very briefly, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but about 20 years ago, a man by the name of Mr. George Thompson started verbal judo for law enforcement. Was the state of Wisconsin has dramatically taken that to a hugely higher level. I don't know if you're aware, but they now have a professional communications instructor course. This is taught throughout the state as part of their tactics training. And also all recruits today go through professional communications. And inside those professional communications, they do address the special needs, the emotionally disturbed, and there's actually simulation training on helping the officers who go through that interact with those people much, much better. So that is something that Wisconsin has actually taken from what I, I work, I do this stuff nationally. They have actually taken, as far as I'm concerned, the leading role in the United States in that area. And I'm sure that your training staff can get you their lesson plan, their communication book, and they also have videos available as well at, at no charge to the department or anyone else. Also, for the gentleman over here, just so you know, in the taser training, it specifically does address in quite some depth where there's elevated risk to individuals, such as the one you brought up, which is fleeing. That is an elevated risk because of the forward momentum. Another one is if they are in water because of the risk that they could drown because they can't catch themselves. One of those is because if the person is obviously frail. Another one, of course, is a pregnant female. The, the principal fear there is from falling. All of those things are addressed in the training within the taser. And the things that you guys are really concerned about, and I agree with your concern, again, Wisconsin, as far as I know, is the number one place in the country for that type of training as we sit here today. And Wisconsin is also leading and developing the Excited Delirium Program, which I'm sure Dave Nichols is very much a part of. Thank you. <coughs> Alderman Brahassel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just on the you know, on the issue of micromanaging, I agree with you 100 percent. There is a, a point that you can go too far and would become ineffective. But I'm sure you'll also agree that taking a broad stroke approach to something can be equally as ineffective. You know, to the point that there's no direction or very little direction. So, I guess um, having been you know in the in business professional for the last 15 years, I've seen <clears> both sides of it, and I think maybe somewhere in between, maybe a little bit more comprehensive detail. <coughs> might might be both good for both sides. Thank you, Alderman Prassel. I, I agree with you. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our police department are professionals, highly trained, professional, dedicated. Lieutenant Irick writes the 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 policies, the training, etc. He's a professional doing what he does. It's not the job of this council to micromanage our police department. These gentlemen know a lot more about what they're doing than we do. That's why they're the police officers, and we're not. Um, at this point, I'd like to call the question, and uh, we'll with another discussion. The question's been called, so there will be no other discussion, and I will ask President Berg to do the roll. You want the roll vote? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Alderman Montemarino, could you repeat the motion? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Um, I make a motion that the Committee of the Whole recommend to the Council or recommend to the Police Department, or whichever is the appropriate um, way to go, to put together a completely comprehensive policy regarding the taser use in Sheboygan, have Lieutenant Nichols look at it closely, get back to you, to us, to see if he has any 
suggestions about things that maybe we should add, perhaps more detail, as um, Alderman Verhassel had said, so that the training, the um, this policy, this directive or policy is completely up to date and comprehensive as it possibly can be. Thank you. And For special needs especially. Alderman Susha, you had second that motion? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Alderman Berg with the roll. Boren. No. Berg, no. Serta. No. Davis. No. Groff. No. Hannah. No. Kittleston. No. Clahunas? Yes. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Radke? No. Ryan? No. Shusha? Aye. Vanderweel? No. Verhaslet? Aye. Motion fails. Thank you, President Byrd. Uh, Alderman Graf. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. The discussion tonight and everything that happened tonight was, was very good, but I do believe that overseeing the policy and possibly some training procedures and, and so forth is really the responsibility of the Public Protection and Safety Committee, the Standing Committee that the, the police and fire and so forth report to. I think a lot of information was, was given to the Chairman tonight, seeing um, you're the Chairman of Public Protection and Safety, and something like that could be brought up and discussed at at your next public protection and safety meeting, and then whatever comes out of that can be reported to council as a report of committee. Uh, and I think that's the way it should be done and, and needs to be done. And with that being said, um, regarding item number five on our agenda, which is the RC 171 and um, the RO 146 I would move that both those documents be placed on, are recommended for, to be placed on file. Second. I have a motion and a second. Do the roll call again? Yeah, yeah. Warren. Here. Bird. Here. Serta. Here. Davis. Here. Groff. Here. Hannah. Here. Kittleson. Here. Clayhunas. Here. Manny. Excused. Meyer. Here. Montemayor. Here. Radke. Here. Ryan. Here. Shusha. Here. For Haslett. Here. Fifteen present. One excused. And I'm here. You didn't call me, so. <laughs> we, That's true. we have a quorum. Your name to put his, to we have a quorum. Uh, next on the agenda is RC number 5410506 and then RO number 1510607, Alderman Graf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move at this time that uh, the RC number 541. And the the two uh, the RO and the general ordinance that is attached to that, and RO number one fifty one zero six zero seven uh, that all those documents be um, placed on file. Second. I have a motion and a second under discussion. Under your discussion, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the reason I'm doing this is um, as it's been pointed out several times, this document uh, is some of these documents are almost eleven months old, if not longer older, and. Um, it may be a, a great idea to do this, but there's half the council that was just elected prior or after this document came to be. And many of them probably don't even have copies of, of what the, the resolution stated <coughs> and what was needed. And I feel if, if there is a need for this committee um, to be formed, that the, um, the original drafters or maybe new drafters of it can, um, can resubmit it and bring it back into the new council and we can act on it uh, on a much, much faster basis. And in addition to that, this is something that should have been discussed, I think, in, uh, in either um, a strategic fiscal planning commission or in uh, one of the other committees prior to being discussed at the Committee of the Whole. Thank you, Alderman Graf. Alderman Montemere? Uh, thank you, Chairman Vanderwill. Um, I can understand what Alderman Graf is talking about. As one of the authors of this, and I understand most of you don't have this. Uh, I brought my copy along. And it, the intent and purpose of the community relations is an advisory board and shall study, analyze, recommend solutions for discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations and facilities on the basis of sex, class, 
race, age, religion, sexual orientation, or ethnic or minority status. Um, it goes on to appointments and the terms, the duties and the authorities, um, equal housing accommodations, and to enjoy equal employment opportunities. Examine the need for initiate, participate, and promote publicly and privately sponsored studies and programs in human relationship fields, um, and so forth. So I think. Even if we, we, we file this tonight, I think it would be a good thing to bring forward because it would then be another board commission to look at those sorts of things in the community that wouldn't be us, it wouldn't be the police, it would be a separate group looking at these sorts of things. Because I know in my neighborhood there was a, a landlord at one time that refused to rent to anything other than white. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Alderman Montemayor. Alderman Meyer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to take all these items and vote on them separately. All right, Alderman Mon uh, Meyer, we will do that. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Alderman Susha? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure how um, the vote is going to go on the, the Community Relations uh, Commission. I do think that we should consider uh, putting that in place. Um, I'm not sure if the public is aware that, um, that the Police and Fire Commission does have the authority to listen to police complaints separate from an internal investigation. And I think at this point in time, until whatever we do, whatever we decide to do with the community relations, um, if anybody does have a serious concern, I would recommend that they contact the city attorney's office and perhaps he can give them some guidance on the proper form that we may already have in place that needs to be filled out. Um, and that would give us some time because even if we pass this tonight, it's going to take um, probably a couple months before we get this commission in place and up and running. So I guess in the meantime, if anybody wants to file a complaint, uh, I would suggest that they contact the city attorney's office in the meantime. Thank you, Alderman Susha. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Hearing none, Alderman Berg, could you call the roll? Dividing the question between uh, the uh, communication from, from Captain uh, Wallace and the ordinance. Uh, will be, I believe that was, I believe Alderman Groff's original motion was to take all the documents and file them, and that was second. So that's the, that's the motion we are currently considering. Okay. We're, we're voting to file all the communications. Correct. Alderman, uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Alderman Meyer asked for a division of the question, therefore separate roles need to be called on each item. Thank you, Alderman Graff. <laughs> Still has a motion to file. <laughs> Alderman Clayhunas. That was my question. That was my question to be sure that we split it. And Thank you. So we'll, we'll vote on item number six first. And then item number seven, is is that what you meant, Alderman Meyer? No. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to vote on item number six one separately, and then item six two <coughs> separately, and then item seven. All right. Thank you. Alderman Bourne? Uh, Alderman Meyer just answered my question. Thank you. OK, so we are going to vote on RC number 5410506, RO number Two three five zero five zero six to file that. Alderman Berg with the roll call. Uh, okay, Berg, aye. Serta, aye. Davis, aye. Graf, aye. Hannah, no. Kittleston, aye. Clayhunas, aye. Meyer, aye. Montemayor, aye. Radke, aye. Ryan. Shusha? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhaslet? Aye. 15 ayes. Motion. Uh, Boren, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Boren. Motion passes. <coughs> then we will vote on RC number 5410506, General Ordinance number 2605060. Alderman Boren, or sorry, Alderman Berg, if you could call the roll. Serta? Aye. Davis? Aye. Graf? Aye. Hannah? No. Kittleston? Aye. Clayhunas? No. Meyer? No. Montemayor? No. Radke? No. Ryan? Aye. Shusha? No. 
Van der Weel. Aye. Verhassel. No. Warren. No. Berg. Aye. Is it a tie? No. No, it can't be. Motion fails. Thank you, Alderman Bro. Alderman Racky. Can I make a motion to send this down to the council with a favorable recommendation then? Second. Motion and a second to send the council with a favorable recommendation. Any discussion? Alderman Hanna. Thank you, Chairman. It's my understanding that this is this is a commission that would be uh, would be no cost to the city to operate. Um, you know, and I, I granted I've not had a lot of time to review it, but I think in in general, um, I think it's heading in the right direction. Thank you, Alderman Hanna. Is there any other discussion on the motion, Alderman Bourne? I didn't understand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't understand what Alderman Radke, Radke is asking. Could you clarify, Alderman Radke? Well, the motion to file it failed, so I made a motion to send this on to council with a favorable recommendation. To Correct. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Uh, attorney, could you step up and, uh, and make a comment? on? It should be. Or maybe you got to turn it on. It's Sounds on. like it's on. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just have a couple comments about the document. I, I think the concept is good. Uh, there's a statute that is on point that the uh, uh, authorizes municipalities to establish commissions on community relations. And in fact, uh, the statute uses language that encourages municipalities to do so. Um, the section is cited in the first section, 2 808, that's section 66.0125 of the Wisconsin statutes. Um, <clears throat> I guess the uh, concern I have is that uh, the document that's before you uh, doesn't uh, doesn't track the the statutory authority as closely as I think it should, and I think the uh, the the biggest concern I have is in the complaint section that you've got current statutory procedures uh, to deal with complaints against city employees. You've got the Civil Service Commission, you've got the Police and Fire Commission, you've got the Ethics Board that deals ethics complaints against uh, city employees, uh, you've got the Fair Housing Commission. Uh, the, the statute that, that this uh, is derived from doesn't have any provision in there for uh, this commission having uh, authority to hear disciplinary complaints against anyone. What it is is nonpartisan advisory body, and the, the statutory language says uh, to study, analyze, and recommend solutions for the major social, economic, and cultural problems which affect people residing or working within the local governmental unit, including, without restriction because of enumeration, problems of the 
of the family, youth, education, the aging, juvenile delinquency, health and zoning standards, and discrimination in housing, employment, public accommodations, and facilities on the basis of sex and other uh, prohibited basis of discrimination. It doesn't provide for a complaint process. It does authorize this body to, uh, to hold public hearings, but it's not public hearings to the extent that they're disciplinary hearings. In other words, there's no subpoena power given to this commission under the statute. Uh, they do have the power to hold public hearings, and the, the intent is to get input and, and to discuss sort of broad issues <coughs> affecting the community that relate to relationships in the community. It's not, in, in my view, it's not the intent of this statutory body to be a complaint mechanism uh, for uh, allegations of wrongdoing by city employees. Uh, so that's the concern I have specifically with this document. I think a lot of it is, is laudable and, and uh, uh, very good, and I think uh, uh, should be uh, should be established if that's what the council wishes to do. But uh, much of this, I think, uh, is is dealt with by other statutes, uh, is dealt with uh, as a supervisory issue for uh, employee complaints uh, or citizen complaints about employees should be dealt with as a supervisory issue. Uh, to the extent they aren't being addressed, then department heads need to deal with that and uh, uh, the mayor and perhaps the council at that point. But to <coughs> authorize a forum for people to file complaints without any provision in here that they be uh, notarized or sworn statements or anything like that, I think you're just opening up uh, an area that is going to have uh, potential for a lot of problems. So I guess my suggestion, if, uh, if I would have one, would be to uh, perhaps have a committee you know, look at this more carefully and uh, perhaps rework it and come back to the council with something else. That's my opinion. You can do uh, uh, as you wish, but as I say, uh, the provisions in here for complaints and uh, disciplinary hearings is not uh, part of the contemplation of the statute. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Uh, Deputy Chief Sherman, could you come forward? Do you have something to add? I'd uh, like to address the council as far as the police department's position on this. We are, uh, we are definitely against this. Uh, we're committed to the fair and equitable treatment of all of our citizens. Uh, we're concerned about uh, the well-being and the, and the fairness of, of all the citizens in our community. We already have a mechanism to address this. This is 6213. This would be to the, uh, uh, to the police and fire commission if there's any problem with uh, discipline. This would be un one unnecessary level of additional uh, uh, scrutiny. There's a lot of unanswered questions with this. Uh, are officers entitled to legal representation? Is the city exposing itself to unnecessary litigation? How will it affect uh, ongoing criminal or internal investigations? We just feel that it uh, uh, opens the city to unnecessary legal problems. A couple of other points. The police department has been the victim of false accusations in the past. We've been, uh, uh, officers have, there's been false imp uh, impressions of impoliteness, impressions of uh, false impressions of dirty looks. Even the chief has been uh, accused, falsely accused of wrongdoing with the closure of 21st Street and North Avenue. Uh, police departments deal with confrontations all the time. Uh, they don't call the police when uh, things are going good. We feel that this is arbitrary and broad, and it should be rejected. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Alderman Verhassel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a question for Attorney McLean. You were mentioning state statute. Does state statute prohibit Sheboygan from establishing a committee that's being suggested by this resolution that would be able to hear complaints? 
Is it, does it prohibit us from doing so? specifically prohibit that, no, but it, it does say in section 2 of 660125, uh, an ordinance or resolution establishing a commission shall substantially embody the language of subsection 3. And subsection 3 gives the purpose and functions of the commission, which, as I say, does not include the complaint mechanism that is in the proposed ordinance. The city of Sheboygan is well within their bounds of establishing a community relations committee that would be able to hear complaints. We're within our boundaries. To do what? To establish a committee that would be able to hear complaints, as is being suggested. Well, We can do that. As I say, you can do anything you want, uh, but you've got to run into conflicting statutes. Discipline of police officers, firefighters, is exclusively the jurisdiction of the Police and Fire Commission under 6213. Uh, the Civil Service Commission has authority to hear employee grievances. If the employees have an issue with uh, discipline, then we can appeal to the Civil Service Commission. Uh, they've got jurisdiction on employee discipline and employee complaint. Uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with uh, people, with having a mechanism for people to make complaints against uh, city employees. I'm not suggesting that you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. But what I'm suggesting is that I don't think that this is the appropriate <coughs> vehicle for the uh, resolution of complaints of discrimination that are alleged against city employees. Uh, the, uh, the ordinance doesn't even address city employees. Uh, it was only newspaper articles subsequent to when this was introduced that there was an indication that this was going to be used or potentially used uh, as a vehicle to hear complaints of discrimination against city employees. There's nothing in the language of the, the ordinance that even talks about that. Just to clarify, if there were a, a, an alleged complaint against a fireman, for instance, or a policeman, whatever the matter, the Police and Fire Commission would have authority to hear that complaint? Yes. So this committee or this Human Relations Committee would be a moot point when it comes to that specific type of situation? Well, it, it, it in, wouldn't be a moot point if somebody filed a complaint with the commission. Then the issue is, what do they do with it? But they wouldn't be able to weigh in on such a matter. The Police and Fire Commission would well, take over and... Well, under your ordinance, they would be able to. So it would be like a... Adopted. A dual recommendation or a dual? No. How would that work? I, I don't think it would. That's that's the problem I see as a potential uh, difficulty in administration. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Press. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I guess I'm having a little difficulty going from A to Z and not without the other 24 letters being there. Um, this commission is, is not leg being legislator or attempted to be legislated for the purpose of administering uh, disciplinary action against anybody. We all know who can do that. Uh, this, this commission is being put together <coughs> to address public issues big public, public issues that this council nor the mayor nor some committees have the manpower to do the legwork or the research uh, that's, that's, uh, that's needed. I'm not quite sure where Attorney McLean's coming from because he had two times to, to review this uh, himself and we both talked about it back and forth. But somebody's trying to tell me that there's something in there there isn't. I'm not seeing what, what they're saying. Is it, there's no there's no provision here to discipline or to usurp, I should say, the power, statutory power of the Police and Fire Commission or the Civil Service Commission or a department head. But the only way a commission of this, of this nature can address public policy and make recommendations to the council is to have something before it. And that something before it has to be something that's credible. And that's called a complaint. Now that complaint can go somewhere or it can go nowhere, but it will never go, according to this, it's never gonna go 
in an, to an attempt to try to administer disciplinary action against anybody. We have entities for that purpose. So to try to stretch it from A to Z without telling me where the other 24 letters are, I don't know where that's going. But this is a very badly needed commission that address that will deal and tackle severe issues. And I'll give you a real good example of the Ricky case with the uh, nine dogs and the one cat and, and the uh, iguana. I don't have the manpower. I don't have the, you know, the, 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 the knowledge and the, and the time to go and research that. We had to do it. We had to come up with something. We're still having problems with it. Can you believe that? After 13 years and numerous, numerous people being involved in an issue like that, we still cannot enforce an ordinance right now. That's what this commission is going to do, is to look at those issues that are more broad that some of us cannot even tackle, much less understand, because we, don't, we come and go. And this has been going on for 13 years. But they'll be able to dedicate themselves to just solely that. No one, and I don't know why it has to become an issue every time, no one is trying to take power away from anybody that's already established. All it's trying to do is make our system better and more responsive to the people that we're supposed to be representing. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Alderman Matsumir. Uh Thank you, Chairman Vanderwill. I have been looking and reading and rereading, and I don't see the spot in any of these words here that the, the, the words, their concerns, fit into any of these words on these two pieces of paper. I don't understand. I mean, this has to do with housing, employment, complaints <coughs> in the community. So, I don't know where they, exactly what they're talking about in these two pages that they're upset about. Thank you, Alderman Montemer. Alderman Hanna. Oh. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would, perhaps one of the, the authors of this um, ordinance could walk me through an example. Let's say we were presented with a complaint against one of our firemen. How would this, would we just redirect that to the Police and Fire Commission? Is that correct? Yes. That, that was my understanding. And it depends on what kind of complaint it is. If it's a disciplinary action, it's got a place to go. Gotcha. If it has to do with how do we create a better ordinance for fire protection for the community, why couldn't they look at that and make a recommendation to the council? That's a bigger scope, a bigger picture that's not being addressed right now because it cannot be addressed right now because people don't have the manpower and the knowledge and the ability to research this extensively, whereas this commission would. And as you mentioned earlier, it's not, it's not going to cost us anything. It's all volunteer work. Thank you. Alderman Clayhunas. I guess I, I also am uh, wondering, I don't see anything personal here. It doesn't say city employee once, I think, in any of the, of the statements in here. So um, it's not taking the city to task. It could be just general. It could be you know, a <coughs> private citizen or a group or something that is doing something that's discriminatory. And it doesn't have to be taken personally that this is going to be a city employee every time. Uh, and I agree that there are many ways in which we can direct this. I was speaking with a person over the weekend about this very committee. And there are, uh, this person had experience with it in another uh, city. And um, he's here tonight. And I don't know if you, uh, Rick Jordan? Um, Rick talked to me about it, and he said there's ways in with, lots of ways in which you structure this so people don't come with frivolous complaints. They have means in which they have to prove through their complaint, their witnesses, there's procedures, forms, that this is very orderly, and this is not just some ranting or some um, you know, witch hunt. It's something that's really substantiated, and I, I think, uh, what are we afraid of? Thank you, Alderman Clehunas. Alderman Burke. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I a couple of thoughts. Uh, one in response to one of the uh, conflicting uh, issues that did present that Attorney McLean talked about under Section 2-815. The complaint must be signed and dated by the complainant, uh, and the commission shall act upon the complaint no later than 30 days after its submission. So it suggests that there is a time period required for action. Also, the complaint goes uh, according to this. A person under this ordinance may file a complaint with the commission, so it goes directly to the commission. Uh, in other words, it doesn't pass through the legislature. Uh, 
I was originally a co-sponsor of this. Uh, I looked up the statute also. Interestingly enough, the statute's been around 30 years. It's entitled the Wisconsin Human Rights Act. And in that regard, because it dealt with broad social policies and other communities, they have social development commissions. Those commissions in the past were able to receive uh, grant money, uh, title money to do specific training uh, in areas of, of interest, uh, I, I felt that this was a good idea. Where, for me, the confusion came uh, was in the uh, August 8, 2005, Sheboygan Press. And if I could quote from that, it's an article written by Bob Petrie of the Press staff. And I quote, Mayor Juan Perez is proposing a commission to review citizen complaints of discriminatory actions against them by city employees. The commission, that's the lead, the Commission on Community Relations would have the authority to hold public meetings, handle the complaints, and make recommendations to the Common Council on possible employee sanctions or on creating ordinances that would ensure equality for people regardless of sex, age, race, uh, uh, sexual orientation, or color. And I think because the tone of this article specifically focused on city employees, that gave the pause because it isn't the tool, it's how we use it. And I guess I am opposed to that very narrow interpretation of using this, especially as the article outlines for possible employee sanctions. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor President, did you want to address that? Oh, Alderman Burton makes a good point. Uh, but I've never been one, and no offense to the Sheboygan Press, to uh, to follow what they print in the paper. Uh, you have before you the ordinance. Now you have two choices. You can follow the ordinance or the article. And I think we're obligated to follow the ordinance when hopefully this is passed. So the press uh, can say what it wants and can interpret it as it pleases. But what's going to guide us is the ordinance that you pass yourself and you're, and you're looking at it. I mean, there's nothing there to speak to that effect. And it may have been early, as I said, this, this thing went through, through a, a, a process, to, to, uh, uh, through a process of being looked at twice by the city attorney, looked at by myself, and I think Alderman Burke, and mostly every alderman that was here to look at it, and everybody then agreed that it was a good thing. I still agree that it's a good thing. And what people are telling me they're reading in there is a big stretch of the imagination for me. It's not there. And I think this is what we'd be uh, uh, obligated to follow, not the Sheboygan Press. No offense, Eric, if you're still here. Thank you, Mayor. Alderman Susha. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I would make the recommendation that we send this um, back to council with a positive recommendation that will give us um, a, a week for uh, Attorney McLean to look at it again, perhaps at, once it gets to the council floor, if he'd feel more comfortable um, adding amendment, adding a paragraph at the end to uh, clarify something he's uncomfortable with. Uh, this is, a lot of work has gone into this. It's quite an extensive document, and uh, we've had a lot of good discussion on it here tonight, and I, I guess I'd like to see us move ahead uh, with sending it to council a positive recommendation, give him a chance to amend it on the council floor, and with that, I'll call the question. With that, there'll be no other discussion. The question has been called. Alderman Berg, could you call the roll? Uh, can we repeat the motion? And who, and who second the motion? Second. And the motion was to send to council with a favorable recommendation. All right. I'll remember. Okay. Boren? No. Berg? No. Serta? No. Davis? No. Groff? No. Hannah? Yes. Kittleston? No. Clayhunas? Yes. Meyer? Montemayor? Aye. Radke? Aye. Ryan? No. Shusha? Aye. Vanderweel? No. Verhassel? Aye. Seven ayes? Did you? Eight noes. Motion fails. Alderman Graf. Thank you, your, um, Mr. Chairman. Then at this point in time, I'd, I'd move to refer this to the city attorney's office to review and uh, draft any corrections that he may need and to then submit it to council uh, 
for their approval or their denial, whichever. Motion a second. Just a question, does refer overpower what we just did? Oh, it was dead. I'm sorry. I apologize. It's getting late. <laughs> okay, I have a motion and a second under discussion. Alderman Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would think it would be best appropriate to, as recommended, have the city attorney look at this, but also get it to a committee. That way we do give the public an opportunity to speak on this issue by bringing it directly to the Common Council. We're bypassing that opportunity for the public. Thank you, Alderman Serta. Attorney McLean. Could you, would you like to speak? Uh, if I could, Mr. Chairman, just, uh, you know, I don't mean to dodge work or anything like that, but referring it to me, I, I would appreciate if it's referred to me some direction as to what you want, because I've kind of outlined the concern I have, uh, and uh, Alderman Berg, you know, read from the Sporting Press, that was the concern I had, uh, and that, I, I didn't have that concern when I originally reviewed the document prior to that discussion. Uh, I don't think it ought to be uh, a mechanism to deal with employee uh, complaints against city employees. Uh, if you know, I, I don't see a problem with them hearing complaints. You know, the problem is they don't have any authority. And if they're hearing discrimination complaints against their neighbor, say, or against some landlord, uh, there's other mechanisms for that as well that, that do have teeth. Uh, the council can't, you know, a recommendation of the commission to the council on a complaint like that uh, isn't going to carry any sanction. In other words, uh, you could not say, okay, we find the landlord in violation of the uh, discrimination laws and establish some sort of a fine or anything like that. Uh, yes, it could be brought to your attention, um, but that sort of a complaint where it's a specific uh, allegation of discrimination by someone against an individual, uh, I don't think this is the right forum to deal with that. I think this is the forum to deal with the fact that we have problems with uh, you know, just to use an example, with landlords who are not renting to minorities. You know, and how do we address that problem? Do we adopt some ordinance? Do we, you know, address that more globally as opposed to uh, acting on a specific complaint about a specific incident where uh, a landlord didn't rent to a minority? And what do you do with that? You make a finding that there was discrimination, and then so what? That's all you've done is kind of led somebody down a path that they think is going to end up with some resolution of that, and really the council is not going to be empowered to make a finding, or you can make a finding, but to do anything with that as far as the disposition. You can't hold the uh, landlord in contempt. You can't require them to do anything. There's a, a current process through the EEOC through Equal Rights Division at Diller for those specific types of com complaints. So uh, I guess if it's referred to me, what I would look at is removing the complaint section as it deals with specific allegations of wrongdoing by one person against another. Uh, general complaints as to uh, types of issues, types of discrimination, I think would be appropriate, but uh, that, that's how I would address it if, if it was referred to me, unless you tell me otherwise. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would make a motion to move it over to law and licensing, and we'll address it there with the attorney's office and address all the concerns that people have with this ordinance at that point. Second. We'll send it back to the committee. Thank you, Alderman Recky and Alderman Graf. So I have a motion and a second on the floor. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Triple aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next on the agenda, 
We have a motion to file RO number 1510607. Any discussion on that? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Trevor votes aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Motion to adjourn. Motion, motion is second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned.